good morning to all of you so uh, as the first uh, case in this uh, rheumatology and gastroenterology collaborative meeting i will present this case uh, mr j a 66 year old uh, laborer from kulia uh, he is a patient with chronic plaque psoriasis since 1994 and uh, distal interphalangeal joint pain and deformities were there in this patient he had started treatment in 1998 with local applications phototherapy uh, methotrexate including intramuscular and oral therapy which was omitted uh, two years later due to alcoholism, according to his medical records. He had been also on acetylprene and cyclosporin A in 2004, again omitted probably due to leukopenia, and later he was on hydroxyurea. And he had defaulted follow-up since 2006 and taken only intermittent treatment for the skin disease, and the, there was no significant progression of the joint deformities. He was not on any regular medication and had not taken any alternative medicine recently. He presented with worsening skin involvement of psoriasis for three weeks duration involving the scalp, trunk and extremities. And there was intermittent pain at the distal interphalangeal joints of right fifth and left second and fifth fingers. Mm -hmm. There were no joint or finger swelling, and there was no history of stiffness as well. Uh, there was no symptoms involving other peri peripheral joints or axial joints. He had no fever or other constitutional symptoms, and the systemic inquiry was unremarkable. And uh, he had been recently treated for a left foot cellulitis at the local hospital one week prior to the flare of the skin disease. Uh, there was no history of diabetes, hypertension, or dyslipidemia. And he was a smoker with 20 pack year history. And alcohol, he had used 40 units per week in early 2000, but then uh, it was cut down to occasional consumption for the last couple of years. And the last consumption was about three months back. He had no history of hepatitis, blood transfusions, IV drug abuse, high-risk sexual behavior. <laughs> and uh, the past med surgical history and family history was unremarkable. So upon e examination, he was not on in distress or pain. The BMI was 20. Uh, there was generalized extensive erythematous scaly plaques with nail changes suggestive of uh, flare of psoriasis. There was no pallor lymphadenopathy or ankle edema, and uh, he had no significant peripheral stigmata of chronic liver cell disease. And in the musculoskeletal examination, there were flexion deformities involving the right fifth and left second and fifth distal interphalangeal joints with mild tenderness. There was no swelling or dactylitis. You will be able to see the deformities in this picture. And his investigations, uh, the inflammatory markers were relatively normal. Full blood count was normal, plated 196. The renal functions was also normal, and the, uh, there was no diabetes. In the other investigations, we could see that his AST and ALT level were significantly elevated. And uh, the other uh, parameters of the liver profile were relatively normal. The ultrasound scan of the abdomen and pelvis revealed a normal study. The liver was not enlarged. The cogenicity was normal. No focal liver lesions or intrahepatic duct dilatation. And there was no ascites or and, uh, no splenomegaly. However, when we applied the FIB4 index for this patient, it revealed a 3.23 points, which was suggestive of advanced fibrosis. Uh, during this presentation, patient was uh, managed uh, with uh, optimal dermatological management with local applications and hydroxyurea. And in summary, this patient is a 66-year-old male with a chronic plaque psoriasis presenting with uh, extensive flare of psoriasis and mild peripheral psoriatic arthritis. He had a past history of methotrexate therapy and alcohol abuse. And investigations revealed elevated transaminases with normal ultrasound uh, scan of the abdomen and pelvis. So as problems, we had a patient with extensive flare of chronic plaque psoriasis, uh, psoriatic arthritis with chronic distal interphalangeal joint deformities with low disease activity, and altered liver profile hindering the initiation of DMARDS. So we have several questions for the, our expert panel. So how can we explain the liver derangement in this patient? Is it an acute problem, advanced fibrosis, or chronic liver cell disease? Uh, what are the treatment options uh, available for this patient? As, uh, uh, he has uh, the skin and joint disease. Ideally, he sh 
should uh, be receiving a biologics like TNF inhibitors, interleukin 17 or JAK inhibitors. But due to the cost uh, and uh, availability issues, uh, he may need other DMARs like methotrexate, cyclosporino, the other DMARs. And uh, we would like to know with the uh, is it possible to use methotrexate in a patient with chronic liver cell disease? Okay, thank you, Nadir, for the presentation. Uh, may I invite Professor Niriella to discuss this session? Yeah, okay, right, very interesting case. Uh, so, uh, this patient has a very significant unsafe alcohol use uh, in the past. Uh, he has taken uh, for quite some years, but he has ab sort of not abstained, but cut down recently. So there is a risk for uh, chronic liver disease. Um, so the clinical examination did not reveal any stigma of chronic liver disease. And I suppose the abdomen examination was also unremarkable. Uh, but the enzyme, the, the bio liver biochemistry uh, shows significant elevation. So what we call by a significant uh, derangement of uh, liver biochemistry is when the liver enzymes are more than two times the upper limit of normal. So roughly we take the upper limit of normal irrespective of the lab uh, reference range. We take ALT more than 30 for males and uh, AST more than 19, you can remember as 20 for females. So more than two times upper limit of normal for males is more than 60 and more than two times upper limit of normal for females is 40. So if these enzymes are persistently elevated, I saw that you all have done two values right. and it's persistently elevated. So this is, should be taken as significantly deranged. So the derangement can be mild, moderate to severe. So depending on the, the number of times the upper limit of normal, we say between 2 to 5 is mild elevation. Between uh, 5 to 15 is moderate. More than 15 is severe elevation. So this is, for this male, this is probably mild elevation. Okay. And if you go back to the biochemistry, can I have the biochemistry back? Okay, so the, 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 the blood count shows normal platelets, 196 we probably will take as normal. Uh, so there is no AST, uh, ALT reversal. So in most of the chronic liver diseases, we would expect the ALT to be more than, more than AST because the half-life of ALT is much, much longer than the AST. But in certain instances where there is chronic liver disease, liver fibrosis, architectural distortion. Uh, this AST is usually cleared by sinusoidal clearance. So in chronic liver disease and fibrosis, the AST tends to persist more. The half-life tends to go up. And that's why in cirrhosis, even in early stages, we see that the AST starts to catch up with the ALT and ultimately it reverses. So there is no, uh, so it's starting to catch up. So if you see the AST and ALT, they are not much dissimilar. So, so if there was no fibrosis, I would expect the ALT to be like 136 and the AS to AS be like 50 or 60. But here, they are, they are trying to sort of AST is creeping up to the ALT level. So they, that might be a marker of underlying liver fibrosis. But reassuring thing is that the bilirubin is normal and the albumin is relatively well preserved here and the INR is normal. So there is no significant decompensated cirrhosis in this patient. We know that. Whatever that can be is some degree of fibrosis, if at all compensated, advanced chronic liver disease. We don't use the term CLCD now. Chronic liver cell disease is a term. I don't know where it came from. Probably should be avoided. The correct term is advanced chronic liver disease. Okay. The ultrasound is notoriously operator dependent. So even if there was significant steatosis, ultrasound can be reported as normal because the ultrasound sensitivity of picking up of significant steatosis uh, is where the liver should have about 30% of fat. Okay, steatosis by definition is more than 5% of fat. So normal ultrasound does not reassure that there is no steatosis here. And uh, even some of the chronic liver disease features also can be missed on the ultrasound. So, but it's reassuring to have a normal ultrasound. Uh, so you go to the FIB4, yeah. 
So FIB4 is the first non-invasive test that we would also use in this kind of setting because it is relatively uh, an easy test because we have these values, that we have the patient's age, we have the AST and ALT and the platelet count at our disposal and just put it into a smartphone uh, application and you get this value. Uh, but you should use this with caution because this is not foolproof. As you know, this is age dependent. So age is a factor. You can't apply FIB4 to patients less than uh, 35 because it underestimates fibrosis. And similarly, uh, for patients who are more than 65, it overestimates. So for patients more than 65, the significant cutoff that we take is 2. And for patients between 35 and 65, it is reasonable to take a cutoff of 1.3. And this FIB4 is usually better at ruling out significant fibrosis, okay, not to sort of diagnose cirrhosis or advanced fibrosis. So if a patient has FIB4 of less than 1.3, that is reassuring because there is very high negative predictive value for advanced fibrosis. So it simply rules out advanced fibrosis and we can be reassured there is no significant liver fibrosis. But in this patient, this value is quite high and this is very uh, sort of worrying. Uh, because the reason this is high because the AST is creeping up to catch up with the ALT. So in this kind of patient, we would need the second line assessment, which is usually a fibroscan or liver stiffness assessment by transient elastography to confirm that there is significant fibrosis. Did we have a fibroscan on this no. patient? Okay, right. So that would have been useful. Um, Vananjan, you want to add anything about the evaluation? <clears throat> yeah, um, I, I think I don't think I have anything much to add to what Professor Nigel said, but I would just go back and uh, again in, um, ask the patient very carefully whether he was on any ayurvedic drugs. Simply because when you have clinically a patient who has this level of skin disease, it's very unlikely that everybody who sees him is go are going to look at this and say, "Why don't you treat?" Uh, why don't you try some hemovitia? I know this Ayurvedic doctor who's really good. So it's more likely that people would have uh, said something, and um, I cannot 100% say, but some of these herbal products also may have caused uh, chronic transaminitis sometimes, even if they stop. So I would definitely just go back and try to check that, because sometimes um, if they are taking that, they don't classify that as herbal treatment, they take it as candor. So uh, can the work, uh, hemotech, can the things like that, they're very uh, popular these days. So sometimes if they are contributing and if you stop it and this comes down, it might help us uh, with the rest of the management also. Um, that's all. I, think a, I think a competing, uh, so the, the most likely thing would be alcohol-related fatty liver disease uh, with some degree of significant fibrosis here. But always ask about other competing causes for this uh, chronic uh, uh, sort of liver enzyme elevation. So we would routinely, I think, would do a hepatitis B and hepatitis C, hepatitis B surface antigen and hepatitis uh, C antibody at least. And in this kind of patient, I think we would also do a ANA and ferritin just to make sure that we are not missing anything else. Uh, Udita, you want to add something? Um, no, basically, I don't have a lot to add, but just to, uh, like, just to, uh, you know, you need to make sure that the patient is actually abstinent, although the patient is claiming it. And even if you are you're doing non-invasive testing, it is recommended that you at least wait for two weeks, uh, give a period of two weeks of complete abstinence and uh, before performing any non-invasive tests. So I think that that is something we probably need to look into. So in the presence of uh, ongoing hepatitis, the, the, the transient elastography values can be falsely high. So it's very important that we advise uh, two week, at least two weeks of strict abs abstinence. Always get a history from a collateral historian, not the patient only, from the relatives and so on, to make sure that they are uh, telling the true amount of alcohol intake because they tend to underestimate almost always. Yeah. So that's about the uh, evaluation part. So you want to go back to the questions? So before deciding on treatment, I think we would ad strictly advise this patient to sort of make sure that he is abstinent and then you would probably subject this patient to uh, fibroscan. Uh, 
to make sure what we are dealing with. So uh, the treatment options wise, uh, the most important drug here is probably methotrexate for you all. Is that so? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the, the thinking has changed over the past few years because MTX was labeled a drug that can cause chronic liver disease for almost 50 years. Now, there has been a landmark study came out in last year, 2023, in the Journal of Hepatology, where they looked at patients with psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis exposed to MTX and unexposed to MTX, and they assessed uh, serial assessments with fibroscans uh, in these patients to assess the degree of fibrosis. And interestingly, they found that MTX was not associated with the degree of liver fibrosis, either the dose, cumulative dose, or the duration. It was not associated in any way. What was associated was obesity and diabetes. So the thinking now is that MTX is not the cause, the sole cause, at doses used in rheumatology or in uh, dermatology. In the, in the doses that they are prescribed, MTX does not cause significant liver fibrosis in the absence of other factors for liver disease. So coexisting liver disease where they have NASH or MASH, as we call metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, and some degree of fibrosis, those are the patients who will get uh, persistent liver enzyme elevation and at risk of getting progressive liver fibrosis. So MTX is quite safe to be given to patients if they don't have obesity and diabetes. So that was the take home. And there are two other meta-analyses also confirms that MTX is not the cause of chronic liver disease and progressive liver fibrosis. So we have some good evidence that MTX is quite safe. And uh, in, in our context now with the economic crisis and all, it's a cheap drug. And we can actually use MTX in most of the instances where we think that we can't use it. But remember, MTX is well known to cause acute liver injury. So at initiation or dose escalation, the enzymes can slightly elevate. Okay, so we have to be careful. With careful monitoring and careful selection of patients, we can actually prescribe MTX to uh, a, a large subset of patients who were traditionally thought to be MTX unsuitable. Okay. Um, so the other thing is, so MTX, yes, again can be given in patients with compensated advanced chronic liver disease if the indication. So it's always a risk and benefit. So we want to get the benefit of MTX to control the skin disease or the joint disease while preserving the liver also, not subjecting the patient to an increased risk of liver fibrosis and decompensation. So. So it's a balance, actually. Uh, Manager, do you want to add anything? Oh, Udita? Yeah, so um, I, 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 the problem is this patient, because he's an alcoholic patient, um, history of alcohol, transaminases are high without any treatment, and platelets are already, uh, I mean, 196, but it is, uh, it's not 300, it's 196. So uh, with age, there's a small chance this patient might get cirrhosis in any case. With, with time, so, um, so that's the problem. So even without methotrexate, there is a small chance of cirrhosis because now we are thinking some level of advanced fibrosis. So in another 10 years, um, it's quite possible he'll come with a scan saying early cirrhosis. So um, that's why it's a, there's no good answer. So, so risk benefit, uh, we have to balance, I think. I think the most important thing is alcohol abstinence removing the alcohol and the ongoing liver injury and excluding the other secondary causes of liver injury is very important here. Uh, so generally, out of the demands, I would think acetaprine, um, if you take mycophenolate, hydroxychloroquine, sulfur salicine are quite safe. They can be used in most of the patients with liver disease. So don't worry about those things. Acetaprine, MMF, HCQ, and sulfur salicine, yeah. So leflunamide is an in-between thing. You have to be a little bit more careful with leflunamide because that can cause, uh, so, so there you should be careful monitoring with leflunamide. And uh, MTX, again, if they don't have 
other risk factors for liver fibrosis like obesity and diabetes, again, it's possibly safe. So in this patient, I think we need more data to just uh, decide on MTX uh, before subjecting because then uh, it's better to have a fibro scan and make sure where this patient's liver fibrosis is at present before deciding. Thank you, sir. So if there's a significant fibrosis in fibro scan, do you um, want to stop methotrexate? Yeah. So the fibro scan values that we take uh, uh, which signify a significant degree of liver fibrosis, is, again, fibro scan is also better at excluding uh, significant advanced fibrosis. So less than uh, a stiffness of less than 8 kilopascal is very reassuring. There is high negative predictive value of uh, absence of advanced fibrosis. Anything more than 12, we will be careful. Anything more than 15 is suggestive of cirrhosis. Anything more than 20 is, is confirmatory of cirrhosis. So in those instances, probably uh, we would avoid. But in patients who are uh, less than 8, definitely we can use. In the indeterminate range, we would probably go for a, a liver biopsy and make sure uh, what the degree of fibrosis is because we, we, we cannot classify this patient with a FIB4, then we have done the fibro scan. If the fibro scan is still, uh, the stiffness is between sort of indeterminate range between 8 and 12, the options are a liver biopsy or a MRE or MRE elastography, which is not freely available for us, so it will be a, it will be a liver biopsy. The other thing I want to mention is if psoriatic, psoriasis itself is a metabolic risk factor yeah. uh, in comparison to rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. So we also have observed that psoriatic patients are most of the times having liver function elevation. So it, it itself is a metabolic risk factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay, so if we you. can, if we can always get these patients to lose weight, which is very difficult with the joint disease, that would be ideal. And we should always control the other metabolic risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, and atherogenic dyslipidemia while managing these patients. And, and actually, I think we did not see a lipid profile in this patient with his age. Uh, we don't know whether there are other contributing forces or also slightly. Uh, the question is whether the transaminases can go up uh, solely as a part of active joint or skin disease. No. Very unlikely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Niriel. And Good morning. Good morning, dear colleagues and honorable madams and the expert panel. Today I'm going to present a case. Um, she is a Mrs. X, 62 year old female with zero positive <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis for 10 years. Patient was on 15 milligram of methotrexate weekly and leflunomide 10 milligram daily with good control of her rheumatoid arthritis. She was found to have pan pancytopenia on repeated blood counts on her routine medical visits. Apart from that, she didn't have any complaints as such. So the drugs methotrexate and leflunomide were stopped, but we noticed the pancytopenia to persist. History, she had a, no history of fever, no loss of weight or loss of appetite. There was no history of any chemotherapy or Ayurvedic medication, and there was no toxin exposure. There were no features of any jaundice, itching, abdominal or lower limb swelling. She had no history of any Ayurvedic medication, sharing of needle or intravenous drug abuse. There was no history of any over-the-counter medication as per patient as well. She didn't have any significant family history. The urine output, other system revealed no abnormalities. And 
Importantly, she did not have any diabetes or dyslipidemia. The investigations also proved the same. There was no travel history. Diet-wise, uh, she is a non-vegetarian with average protein intake. And there was no significant surgical, family history or any allergy history. Examination. On general examination, she had an average build of BMI of 24 and the weight circumference is around 36 inches. There was no pillow, no, not icteric. She was hemodynamically stable and there was no lymph nodes or any peripheral or abdominal edema. On abdominal examination, the abdomen was soft, no ogromegaly or free fluid detected. Musculoskeletal examination, uh, DAS-28 is the uh, scoring system for the activity of rheumatoid arthritis, which showed mild active disease. Respiratory and nervous system examinations revealed no abnormality. These are her investigations on uh, first visit and subsequent visit. Even after stopping the methotrexate and lefnunamide, the pancytopenia being the WBC less than uh, around 3, 3.56 and the platelets were around 120 and the hemoglobin was around 9 to 10. This amount of range, actually I, I, I couldn't put the further ranges, this persisted for around uh, I guess 3 months despite stopping the drugs. And serum creatinine and other investigations such as fasting blood sugar, serum cholesterol, they were normal. She couldn't afford, uh, we, we planned for a full lipid profile as well which was also normal. Then we went ahead with the blood picture which showed mild bicytopenia seen with rule formation which can be due to drugs causing bone marrow depression, consider reduction of drugs, exclude renal and liver pathology. I would like to mention at this point of time we have been already stopped her uh, drugs which were supposed to produce any bone marrow suppression. Then we went ahead with the renal function which was already normal and the full liver function test whereas um, the aspartate transaminase showed 35 units per liter and alkaline, the, sorry, ALT was 9 units per liter. Both were within normal range but the AST was slightly higher than the ALT. Total bilirubin, direct bilirubin, indirect bilirubin were normal and total protein was also normal, including the albumin and globulin. Alkaline phosphatase noted to be slightly elevated. The upper range was 104, she had 138. Gamma GT was normal, 23, and PTINR was also normal. Since there was uh, suspicion of, uh, we are supposed to exclude the pathologies of renal or liver, we went ahead with the ultrasound abdomen, which showed early chronic liver parenchymal disease. The liver size was normal, but there was a uh, coarse echogenicity, mild coarse echogenicity was home. Since it shows chronic liver cell disease with the low platelet and there was some discrepancy in the AST LT elevation, we went ahead and did the FIB4 calculation which showed 6.13 points which is advanced fibrosis. This plan, initially we gave vitamin B12 courses, uh, but the pancytopenia persisted despite the vitamin B12, despite stopping the MTX and lefnunamide. However, since there was some evidence of chronic liver cell disease, we stopped MTX and lefnunamide, started on sulfasalicin, and we have done a gastroenterology referral. Now the patient is awaiting a review from the gastroenterology side. The questions we would like uh, to the questions are, what are the pos possibilities of pancytopenia in this patient? And if it is due to the hepatic impairment, what could be the cause of this hepatic impairment in the patient? And is there a place for fit for score in this context? And can we continue methotrexate in this patient because she was well controlled with uh, methotrexate and lefnunamide for last 10 years? I think Udida can take this case. Thank you. So yeah, just to uh, clarify, uh, thank you for that presentation. So just to clarify, uh, did you have baseline uh, blood, uh, full blood counts which were actually normal? All cell lines were normal? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah, and this normal. happened during the uh, the treatment with uh, methotrexate and leflunomide. 
Yes, apparently she was on methotrexate and no leflamide uh, for a long time. Okay. Those time, the, it was around 10 years. Uh, that right. time, it was normal. I mean, and was there any any triggering event, any viral infection, or any uh, any additional drugs that could have contributed to the pancytopenia during that time? Is there anything? Uh, probably uh, not. I think you probably would have gone into. From the first episode of pancytopenia, there was for last few months there was no uh, incident of any fever. And Ayurvedic medication, of course, we went deep into the history, which she strongly denied. Apart from the analgesics on and off, uh, she didn't get any over-the-counter medication as per patient. Analgesics also, sir, for last few months, she was on, like, very controlled disease. So, unlikely she has taken any... Okay, thanks. And uh, did you do a retic count or any um, retic index to see whether this is, uh, I mean, that could be a sort of an indicator whether the bone marrow was... Uh, we didn't. Uh, okay. Yeah. Be that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. So uh, as for the first question, I would uh, broadly categorize this into uh, you know hepatic or liver related causes and hematological causes, okay. and I wouldn't be the best person to talk about uh, hematological causes uh, to this audience. Um, so I think, uh, and uh, we see a lot of. I, I uh, thank you for bringing up this sort of a case because we see a lot of uh, blood pictures. Uh, where uh, the final comment is, uh, is probably related to a liver pathology or to exclude a liver pathology. Um, so I think uh, with that, there is a bit of uh, unclearness as to what this liver pathology could be. I mean, is, is it a simple hepatitis or is it cirrhosis or what, what are they talking about? So in a, in a case of, uh, li but because uh, the ultrasound here has suspected some liver parenchymal disease or a coarse liver echogenicity, I think the the main thing that we should exclude is whether there is uh, significant portal hypertension and uh, whether that is causing hypersplenism and uh, whether the hypersplenism is related to this pancytopenia. Um, so um, in this case, uh, and this, this sort of a finding on an ultrasound is also very common um, because maybe because ultrasound machines are so advanced or maybe because there is a background, the, the, the incidental finding of background liver fibrosis uh, which is now uh, clear on the ultrasound. Um, so as for the cause of hepatic impairment, I think uh, before going into that, I think the importance would be the degree of hepatic impairment uh, or whether the, there is enough fibrosis in the liver to cause portal hypertension. So that is one question. So I would take the last question first. Uh, the what is the place of uh, Fib4 score in this context? So obviously, if there is, uh, if you are suspecting a bone marrow, uh, 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 bone marrow disease, and if you are suspecting that if, if there is pancytopenia, which suggests that the low platelets is probably uh, not, I mean, it's uh, it, it, that it may be due to a, a bone marrow pathology. It, it is probably not the best non-invasive test to use in this patient. And in this sort of a patient, I think you should have a lower threshold for going for a um, imaging-based test or a fibro scan or a uh, shear wave elastography, uh, uh, some form of uh, fibrosis assessment. And of course, as uh, Prof. Niriel mentioned, now uh, we, are, we have uh, changed the nomenclature of uh, liver cirrhosis, what we used to call liver cirrhosis because liver cirrhosis is not a, a clinical diagnosis. Uh, into advanced chronic liver disease. And that nomenclature is also dependent on the uh, transient elastography of fibro scan score. So uh, there is a cutoff. And similarly, uh, there is a, like, a, I mean, there's a very uh, frequent conference in Bav uh, called the Baveno Conference where they uh, discuss about all things related to portal hypertension. And in the last one, they have given non invasive cutoffs to suspect. Uh, uh, clinically significant portal hypertension or symptomatic portal hypertension in a patient with liver cirrhosis. So I think in this sort of a patient, in this patient, it would be important to get a fibro scan or a liver elastography done. And basically what they have said is, if it's less than 15, you can exclude clinically significant portal hypertension. Uh, if it's between 15 and 20, but of course, again, that interpretation is with the platelets. So it's, it is it's going to be a bit tricky here because we are not sure why the platelets are low. If it's uh, more than 20, you can suspect again with the platelet count. And uh, if it's 25, over 25, then that would rule in clinically significant portal hypertension. So if, if you do a fibro scan on this patient, if it's more than 25, 
then there is a like a uh, uh, like a like a basis for thinking that that this may be related to the liver pathology and the other uh, non invasive ways uh, now they are, they are there is a uh, more interest in uh, splenic stiffness measurement which is done a similar uh, similarly and that is also basically good to rule out clinically significant portal hypertension if it's less than 40 um, so in this sort of a patient i think that would be uh, the most important investigation to decide on whether this is a significant uh, liver pathology or not uh, of course i think in, in in parallel to that you would have to get a hematological input and uh, sort of work on the hematological um, aspect of it as well you have anything to add sir? yeah basically uh, this kind of uh, pancytomania in the absence of spinomegaly or any image characteristics of uh, clinical signum portal hypertension is uh, a bit doubtful and I would strongly go behind a hematological cause to exclude that because the platelets may be uh, falsely uh, sort of uh, over-represented. Over spleen is enlarged? No, no spleen was normal oh, actually. Oh, spleen was normal. Oh, right. But still this can be compensated advanced chronic liver disease with clinically significant portal hypertension. You said the patient was actually uh, overweight, she had central obesity, uh, but she did not have any other. She had waist circumference? Uh, yes, sir. waist circumference is 36, BMI was within around 24. Yeah, anything more than 23 is overweight. Overweight. Yeah, for, for Asians. So, yeah. this may be a sort of metabolic dysfunction associated, uh, steatotic liver disease related uh, uh, cirrhosis also. Uh, so here I think uh, make sure that the, there is no alternative explanation for the pancytopenia by a hematology consult and if they can't find a thing, uh, I think uh, then it can be explained by clinically significant portal hypertension but as Sudhita said, we have to do a fibro scan, elastography to assess both uh, liver stiffness and splenic stiffness that should confirm the portal hypertension. And uh, there was a question whether if this is compensated advanced chronic liver disease and clinically significant portal hypertension. Udita, would you continue the leflunomide and MTX? Um, I, I would say uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a tricky question. I think it will depend on uh, your input as well. But uh, in control, uh, continuing methotrexate in a patient with metabolic risk factors would be, uh, uh, would be, I would be a little hesitant to continue it. So I think I would think about uh, withholding the methotrexate. Leflunomide, of course, because he has been, she has been on it for a long time and the liver functions are normal and uh, there is uh, no evidence of drug-induced liver injury, I would, uh, I would be, uh, uh, I mean, more confident in continuing that. Can we have a mic? Do we have a mic? No, it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. I think before initiating, all, a patient should have a baseline scan just to make sure uh, the starting point. Uh, and there is no, as I said in the previous case, there is no this uh, cumulative dose of MTX that is uh, regarded as toxic to the liver. So we don't go by a cumulative dose anymore. That is one thing because the traditional studies were done 30, 40 years ago when there was not much knowledge about the underlying fatty liver disease or hepatitis C. So most of the studies that actually the historical studies that showed MTX causing liver fibrosis would have been cases with NASH or hepatitis C. Okay, that is an important point. So definitely do at baseline an ultrasound, make sure that there is no steatosis. If you have steatosis, if you want to start MTX, patient has to lose weight. They have to get to ideal weight. They have to control their diabetes, and then only we would consider MTX. And usually, the MTX at initiation, there should be 
because I said MTX can cause acute liver injury. So we would do at least once or twice, uh, once in two weeks, the liver enzymes for the first month and then monthly for three months and three monthly thereafter, after one year yearly, usual follow-up. So other thing is if uh, spleen is enlarged, uh, fetus also will come under differential diagnosis. So in that case, to, uh, with the portal hypertension is there or not, it's very important to make uh, the diagnosis. If I may just add, uh, because from a gastroenterology point of view, we think 30% of the population have fatty liver, 30% have diabetes. So, uh, because I think the question was how to monitor the patient, I think we can't, rather than monitoring the first sign where we think the platelets are going down, not explained by the drugs, would be the point to do the scan. I think uh, on, when we, uh, we do routine scan uh, tests, and if you find a platelet count, and we are very uh, sensitive about the platelet count, even if it's 140, for us, uh, it could be a sign of early compensated cirrhosis. So once you have a low platelet count, less than 150, which you can't explain by your known complications of the drugs that we are using, then I think we have to keep a high index of suspicion. And then we have to ask the radiologists. I mean, uh, I'm used to from uh, peripheral hospitals where we don't have fibro scan, but uh, definitely we, we should, that should be the test of choice. But uh, as a start, we can ask for ultrasound with the portal vein Doppler from the radiology department. And if they diagnose uh, nodularity, nodular surface on the surface of the liver, then we'll be able to diagnose uh, uh, early compensated cirrhosis, so um, it's probably irrespective of the treatment you're giving, but uh, um, at that point I think we can come to the diagnosis and then need serious scans for hepatoma surveillance, things like that. Yeah, so, so persistently elevated liver enzymes and a trend in dropping platelets which should trigger scans. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. So, shall we move to the next case? A very good morning to all of you. Today I'm going to discuss a case uh, which was uh, experienced by Dr. Uttpala Disanayaka, who is right here in the audience. Uh, so, let me start off with the clinical history. So, this is uh, a presentation which was in 2019, March. Uh, this was a 68-year-old male with controlled type 2 diabetes and normal BMI who was an occasional alcohol consumer and a non-smoker. He has presented with bilateral symmetrical polyarthritis and bilateral Achilles tendinitis for a period of three months with significant early morning stiffness more than one hour. Initial investigations revealed a normal full blood count with a platelet of 164 with normal liver function tests as mentioned here. And at the same time, anti-CCP antibody and rheumatoid factors were very highly positive with high positive teachers. After these initial investigations, we came to a diagnosis of seropositive rheumatoid arthritis and patient was started on nephronamide 10 mg daily with HCQ 200 mg daily and a low dose of oral methylprednisolone. So two months later, while into therapy, uh, a full blood count was repeated and it uh, accordingly shows a low platelet count of 124 with normal WBC and differentials and a normal hemoglobin level. At that time, AST and ALT were normal as well as the rest of the liver function tests. So we carried out a full blood count with a blood picture which shows features of chronic inflammation with low platelet counts and we wanted to exclude an ITP which was excluded through the blood picture. Uh, for further evaluation, we also carried out an ultrasound abdomen, which revealed early CLCD. So at this point, uh, leflunamide was stopped and HCQ was continued. And the uh, patient was okay for a period of a uh, few months. But later on, he developed a significant costochondritis with worsening of peripheral joint symptoms. At this point, as this patient was in a rheumatoid arthritis flare, a decision was made after liaising with the gastroenterology team uh, to start on a sulfasalicin. But unfortunately, he developed severe nausea and a, a significant pruritic skin rash, and therefore we could not go ahead with sulfasalicin. And a decision was made, uh, along with the gastro team, to continue leflunamide with close monitoring. 
So five months into treatment, while patient was on leflunamide, he developed multiple recurrent infections, which were most prominently cellulitis, then chest infections, as well as urinary tract infections. But during these episodes, WBC counts were normal with in elevated inflammatory markers. So at this point, uh, after GI team discussion, we uh, switched the patient to MTX because we had no other option. And then uh, we continued MTX at a dose of 15 milligrams per week with folic acid cover with close monitoring of liver function tests. So uh, we were able to put the patient on methotrexate for a period of five months without any complications. However, five months into therapy, he developed an exertional shortness of breath without cough, and therefore this was evaluated by the respiratory team. And unfortunately, while on evaluation for the above complaint, uh, we found that the mantra was positive with normal sputum studies. An HRCT chest revealed NSIP pattern ILD with superadded chest infection. At this time, we treated the chest infection with antibiotics, and later on, since we wanted to continue biologic start, reconsider biologics in this patient, we started him on isoniazid and rifampicin prophylaxis after liaising with the respiratory team. However, three months into anti-TB prophylaxis, there was an elevation of gamma GT levels. So at this point, we withheld uh, therapy and we had to go back to HCQ and deflesacort 6 mg daily. So again, uh, back into uh, square one, three months later, again patient develops this very severe flare while on the above two drugs, and we had to consider rituximab in this patient. And we carried out the hepatitis screen to DECO, which were normal, and thereafter we went ahead with two doses of ivorituximab, which was in 2022 August. After this, fortunately, patient went into clinical remission while on HCQ and deflesacort. He maintained remission for a couple of years, and he is still in remission, but unfortunately, uh, during the routine clinical evaluation for uh, CSCD, uh, in uh, February 2024, the ultrasound abdomen revealed CSCD with portal hypertension and focal liver lesion. Uh, therefore, we went ahead with the triple phase CT abdomen, which revealed CSCD with portal hypertension and two focal liver lesions, as mentioned here. And alpha fetal protein was also elevated. And this patient was managed by the GI team as decompensated CSCD, complicated with hepatocellular carcinoma. And TACE was also carried out for the segment 4 hepatoma and microwave ablation for the segment 7 hepatoma. So I will just give a timeline because this was a complicated history. Uh, so initially, patient presented in March 2019 with symptoms of uh, polyarthritis and uh, initial full blood count and liver profile were normal. And at that time, he was started on leflunomide 10 mg daily with HCQ. And two months into therapy, patient, uh, it was noticed that patient had a low platelet count. And for the evaluation, revealed early CLCD in the ultrasound abdomen. And thereafter, uh, leflunomide was stopped and patient was continued on HCQ. So, uh, five months later, patient had a rheumatoid arthritis flare, and then it was planned to start him on sulfasalicin, but unfortunately we could not initiate because of the allergy, and again, uh, consideration was given to leflunomide and HCQ. So, uh, in 2020 March, patient had multiple infections while on leflunomide with normal counts, therefore a decision was made to convert to methotrexate with folic acid cover. So in 2021 August, patient developed an exertional shortness of breath which was evaluated and found to have NSIP pattern ILD with a superadded chest infection with positive manto. As patient was awaiting biologics, uh, we treated with isoniazid and rifampicin and patient had elevated gamma GT levels. So as a result, we had to withhold both anti-TB and methotrexate and we only continued on HCQ and deflesacort. So in uh, 2022 February, patient developed a severe flare, and since the screening was already done, we went ahead with rituximab two doses after hepatitis screening, and fortunately, patient attained clinical remission with rituximab. 
But unfortunately, again, in 2024, uh, February, he developed hepatocellular carcinoma, which was managed uh, accordingly. So this is the clinical summary. And my questions to the expert panel would be, in TB prophylaxis induced liver injury, can we uh, at least continue a low dose of DMAS like methotrexate in low doses? And how safe is rituximab in a patient with chronic liver cell disease? And does rituximab have any impact on uh, origin of hepatocellular carcinoma like in our patient? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting history. Um, yeah. yeah. If you analyze the question, uh, if in TB prophylaxis induced liver injury, can DMAS cause? Actually, first of all, we have to think whether that is really uh, anti TB induced liver injury. So, if we flip back to the liver functions where we have suspected there, now here we have said uh, TB DILI, drug induced liver injury. Um, I don't have the full liver profile, but as I remember, the gamma TT was 300. Mm -hmm which is sort of, uh, I think we took that, that is the sign of drug-induced liver injury. Yeah. So uh, um, actually, I, I wouldn't completely agree with that because actually drug-induced liver injury, you get a transaminitis followed by a rising bilirubin trend. Yeah. So that's a liver is insulted, SGOTPT are going up, that's rising trend, and it's affecting the liver, the bilirubin starts to go up. So those are the features. You can have a cholesterol jaundice, gamma GT can be a sign, but just the gamma GT being 300, I wouldn't take it as a drug-induced liver injury because, uh, and the, if you, it's a very nice slide, but if you take the whole, whole picture, um, it's actually a progression of a patient who has fatty liver associated cirrhosis, uh, in my opinion, uh, here. So, <clears throat> so, excuse me. So, because you had a patient who was 68 at the beginning, they had diabetes, so that sort of patient, this would be the natural course of uh, history, and you can see how um, uh, the arthritis is an important factor for sure, but you can see how over about five years, his life expectancy is significantly changing over a short, relatively short period of time. So actually what would be really helpful is to have his weight and BMI also on this chart. And if yeah, you see... It's actually normal BMI throughout, sir. It was 20. Yes, yeah. but uh, the, the small things is one is I wouldn't say this is drug-induced liver injury yeah. for anti-TB because only the gamma GT is high. Yeah. Um, in fatty liver disease, gamma GT goes up with a little bit of weight, poorly controlled diabetes, metabolic risk factors coming into play. So that will explain the uh, gamma GT going up. So I wouldn't say it's drug-induced liver injury, whether we should just stop that or not is another matter. So I don't think that's drug-induced liver injury. Uh, at, at the time, we, if we improve the metabolic risk factors, that exercise weight loss, things like that, if the gamma GT is going down, that would probably confirm that that is due to fatty liver disease uh, rather than um, uh, drug-induced liver injury there. And uh, the answer to your question, sorry for coming, taking time for that, but it's uh, probably okay in that situation. Just because the gamma GT was 300, I don't think we, it wasn't drug, probably wasn't drug-induced uh, liver injury for anti-TB. So at that point, can we give DMARDs? Uh, we can give, overall, the, I think we have discussed DMARDs can be given, yes. Uh, whether MTX is the best choice or is, is another question because we have a patient who's having liver fibrosis. So I actually would discuss the be benefits and risks with the patient. Um, on the one hand, uh, we know as Professor Nere very well outlined that uh, methotrexate shouldn't be withheld in a patient who you need. But of course, this is a patient who has liver fibrosis and uh, cirrhosis is maybe what determines his life expectancy overall. So, um, yeah, so it's sort of, Yes and no. If you had something else which is effective for him, probably good. If we don't, maybe no choice as long as the patient understands that he has cirrhosis and uh, it will go. Like in another five years, if some, he dies and somebody says, methotrexate caused your cirrhosis, it will cause problem for the family as well as the patient. So I would, uh, I mean, really counsel with the family and see so as long as they understand that this is not the cause, it's probably your diabetes which is not... Um, improving, I would, that, that's fine, but it's sort of a uh, on risk benefit after counseling with the family. Um, so, what's the next question? Uh, sorry, yes, please. Sorry. 
Yeah, I completely agree with Mahanjana. Uh, that the gamma GT elevation itself should not be taken as drug-induced liver injury. Drug-induced liver injury is, after all, a hepatitis. And the patient would tell that patient has symptoms of hepatitis. They will have nausea, vomiting, and they will be unwell. Was this patient unwell with this gamma GT elevation, with this prophylaxis? Yeah, I think so. We should not be worried about actually if, if, if there was an indication to continue the two anti-TB medications, we could have actually continued if the patient was not having any features of hepatitis. We would be worried if the enzymes are going up to more than upper limit of five times or any rise in bilirubin, then we would be worried. Not the gamma GT elevation alone. Can you go back to your summary slide? So this patient never had normal liver enzymes to start off with. You can't say it's normal because the ST and ALT, yeah, they are sort of, you know, coming to the equal range. And his platelets have always been on the lower side. And that should be a marker of underlying uh, portal hypertension. So this patient actually had, at the time of presentation, he would have had compensated advanced chronic liver disease. And he's a diabetic patient who is elderly. So this patient never should have got MTX because this is a high-risk patient for uh, advanced liver fibrosis. So in this kind of patient, we would actually not consider MTX. We would consider something like a biologic earlier. Yes, sir. Uh, shall I? Yeah. Uh, actually, it was uh, chronic liver cell disease because in the first and also there was uh, multiple cases of uh, chronic liver cell disease. Cause, yeah. And yeah. And yeah. And then that's why we stopped. Uh, Good. I'm saying is you had multiple problems with the DMAS, yes, but yes. in this kind of patient, a biologic would have been okay yes. in the yeah. yeah. Infections. infections, yeah, okay, yeah, complicated patients. What about his scans? What about his scans from 2021 August? Did he have surveillance yes. ultrasound yes. scan every six months? Yes. Because this, this tumor is quite big. It's a five centimeter segment for hepatocellular carcinoma should have been picked up. Okay. Not there. Not there. Okay. Right. That picked up. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I mean, I'm just what I'm saying is that every patient with advanced chronic liver disease should have six-month ultrasound scan, preferably with an alpha-beta protein if available. So both biannual ultrasound scan and alpha-beta protein, please do that. Because in your patients, uh, they are at more risk of hepatocellular carcinoma because they are immunosuppressed. Yeah. And this gamma GT elevation also may indicate a space-occupant lesion, an early one or alkaline phosphatase. If they are creeping up, uh, get, a, get a scan, consultant scan. Sometimes it's better. Yeah. So, so I think we got the answer to the second question, which was uh, uh, whether the biologic was uh, accepted. So I think considering his complicated uh, medical condition and the actual risks of other drugs, probably um, it was a good idea to do and actually you have given the answer because he has tolerated rituximab very well and yeah. that, that is the one where he hasn't had a complication yeah. Yeah. also in this uh, very good history. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think, uh, the second question is, uh, impact of rituximab on hepatocellulocastrum as far as I, uh, yeah, it is a reasonable question but probably not a, very big concern in the overall picture. The, what you have to balance it is with, with the patient having a risk of getting a carcinoma or progressive fibrosis in any case. Um, uh, so I think in this case, uh, I don't think we should, there's no way to blame ourselves at all about uh, giving reduximab because it has been a very good decision in this case. But uh, why, what the causes, actually if you go back to your summary slide, if I might uh, just, uh, the question is whether we could have progressed hepatocellular carcinoma or progression of this patient. Yeah, so actually, 
Probably yes, because what is important is his diabetic diet control throughout the last six years. Now, for example, they will say that, yes, they're controlling, but if you go carefully and ask, they will say they do have white, uh, you know, they're having wheat flour, string hoppers in the morning. You have to really take, uh, integrate them a lot and really challenge them. They, and sometimes their diet control will, will be poor. So those things, BMI, everything will contribute here. But in addition, I might suggest if there's anything that we could have done different, whether we should have, whether we could have reduced the steroid dose a little bit, because actually if you look at the first one, start on leflunamide and hydroxychloroquine, even that place, yes. you haven't added that you have, yes, we have we given have methyl pregnisone from that point onwards. So the problem is uh, fatty liver patients, it's very difficult to, for them to control the diet, difficult for them to exercise with all this. So steroids definitely worsen the fatty liver component. They can't, the, it has a metabolic impact and fatty liver is, will progress, not, not rapidly. It's not like a drug-induced liver injury that we see, but if you start the steroids and observe them in another two to three months, uh, not only is their weight gaining, their liver functions may also go up, that's because the fatty liver, we are um, creating the factors for a progression of fatty liver disease. So here also what's happening is the progression of fatty liver disease would probably aid to this yes. overall progression and that will aid to, I mean not directly, but the risk factor for hepatoma is due to progression of fatty liver associated decomposite mm -hmm. cirrhosis. So if there was anything that I, I might have had, had theoretically to do would be uh, if we could have gone for the um, reduxman or anything else, but reduce the steroid dose because uh, sometimes we don't think it so important, but uh, uh, that's probably that's why we are not even including it here in this list. But for me, because it's... There were small doses, uh, like two milligrams, four milligrams. Short doses. Short doses, yes. So, so uh, yeah, what I want to tell is that rituximab can be given to patients with compensated advanced chronic liver disease. Don't be scared that rituximab increases the hepatocellular carcinoma risk, if that is the question that you wanted answered. So rituximab can be given to patients with compensated advanced chronic liver disease. The thing is, if they are on rituximab, just continue the standard of care with the hepatology team for surveillance. You catch the HCC early. Once you diagnose the HCC, we will withhold the immunosuppression until we do definitive treatment, like the taste and downstaging for the large segment four, six centimeter HCC and the microablation. So the standard of care can continue. Once you diagnose, you stop the immunosuppression, but till then we won't withhold in a patient who is HCC negative for chronic liver disease, we can safely give. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, audience, any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so any patient, rheumatology patient, for the trainees, if they have a persistently elevated liver enzymes or any evidence of chronic liver disease, the chronic liver disease may be related to the underlying rheumatological disease or may not be related to the underlying rheumatological disease. So if it is related to the underlying rheumatological disease, it can be the common autoimmune diseases that we see like autoimmune hepatitis and so on. Or it may be drug related, like what we have discussed, the risk of advanced fibrosis and so on. Or it may be unrelated. So hepatitis C, hepatitis B. So at baseline, all those should be looked into if they have persistently elevated liver enzymes or any evidence of chronic liver disease. Thank you. No, to start off with, he had actually compensated liver disease. Yeah. And another question to you, sir. How, how about TNF uh, alpha inhibitors in uh, compensated CLC? Yeah, it is quite safe. You can use anti TNFs in uh, compensated patients. No problem. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So, shall we move to the next case? I, I, I presume there, there is a lot of uh, trainees in the audience. Uh, if you want any questions clarified at the, the moment, uh, it would be better if we can have a mic for the audience. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, for the fourth case discussion, um, 
it is my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Vaishnavi Arun Priyanda, um, uh, Senior Registrar in Rheumatology and Rehabilitation. Good morning, everybody. This is my second case. So uh, this patient, Mrs. X, 76-year-old lady with knee joint osteoarthritis and osteoporosis for last nine years. She presented with epigastric pain for three days duration. She had a gradu gradual onset deep aching pain. There was no associated GORD symptoms or burning abdominal pain. There was no radiation that lasted throughout the day. She had mild improvement with paracetamol, no specific aggravating factor or relieving factor noted. There was no history of any associated vomiting or nausea, no loss of weight or loss of appetite, no history of jaundice, anemia or itching, and she had <coughs> excuse me, no history of angina. There were, her bowel habit was normal, and there was no history of any fever or recent travel history, no respiratory symptoms, and she did not have any features of connective tissue disorders such as joint pain, rash, or else or so any other features of CTD. Past medical history, there was no diabetes or dyslipidemia. Surgical and allergy history were non-significant. And she is a housewife, mother of two. And as I mentioned, there was no significant travel history. Uh, regarding the drug history, she was on uh, alendronate for osteoporosis for last five years and due to gastric irritation and lack of improvement of in her T-score, which was around 3.45 years ago and after uh, in between uh, T-score assessment also did not show much improvement. Therefore, we, we initiated her on IV zolindronic acid one week ago this presentation and she has received her first dose. I forgot to mention she had a ultrasound in 2015 which showed fatty liver grade 1 and she was on atovastatin for her dyslipidemia. Family history, there is no significant family history of any liver disease and she's a non-diabetic. Examination, she was average built, no pallo or non-icteric and no lymph nodes or ankle edema. Abdominal examination, there was mild epigastric and right hypochondriac tenderness. There was no organomegaly or free fluid, no hepatic or splenic brui. Respiratory exam <coughs> examination, there was no significant abnormality. Musculoskeletal examination, there was uh, bilateral knee joint crepitus with uh, previous total knee replacement scar and a right varus deformity. Neurological examination was normal and her eyes were normal. Investigation, she has a full blood count which was normal. Uh, platelet is around 156,000. ESR is around 48 millimeters. CRP normal. Serum TSH, serum creatinine, serum calcium were all within normal range. But her liver enzyme, the ALT and AST were persistently elevated. She had a, a 455 units ALT and two, 262 units AST, which persisted around 200 to 300, 300 range in subsequent two evaluation as well. Gamma GT was 180, the normal range was 5 to 40, and alkaline phosphatase was 129. Bilirubin levels were normal. Total protein was normal, but she had a serum albumin of 3.9 with a serum globulin of 4.5. Her INR was 1.16. With this elevation, she, uh, we did an ultrasound, some basic uh, screening, and a ANA, where the ANA was positive in 1 in 2000 range. Unfortunately, the pattern was not available in that report. Ultrasound abdomen showed grade 1 fatty liver and hepatitis B surface antigen, antihepatitis C antibody and those were negative. So we, de we did a hepatology referral at this time and they uh, continued to evaluate further where 
the serum immunoglobulin G level was done, which was around 2079, and anti smooth muscle antibody was negative, and upper G endoscopy was done, which showed only reflex esophagitis and antral gastritis, possibly drug induced. A multidisciplinary treat, uh, meeting was arranged, and decisions were made to stop atovastatin, to start vitamin E 400 international unit daily, but the transaminitis persisted, and the gas gastroenterology team went ahead with the liver biopsy, suspicion of autoimmune hepatitis type 1. But the liver histology showed no features of autoimmune hepatitis. Thereafter, anti lk m antibody was also done, which was negative. Then the fibro scan was arranged by gastroenterology team, but the patient defaulted. She defaulted our clinic as well, and after four months later, she came to the clinic where we again evaluated her in terms of her liver functions, where the liver enzymes were normalized. Actually, the full liver function test was at that time was normal, which is around four months later, the initial presentation. Um, the question to the ex expert panel is, what could be the cause of her liver enzyme elevation? Right. So very interesting case, a uh, middle-aged uh, female with osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis. without uh, uh, knee joint osteoarthritis yes. and osteoporosis, yes. without any metabolic risk factors yes. she didn't have. She yes. was uh, normal built. Yes, sir. Yeah. So this is autoimmune hepatitis until proven otherwise for me. I mean, it's autoimmune hepatitis written all over. Uh, middle-aged female coming with persistently elevated uh, liver enzymes, uh, high ESR, ANA strongly positive, isn't it? Yes. Uh, immunoglobulins positive. Mm. I wouldn't mess around with vitamin E and anything. I would straight away go for a liver biopsy in this patient. But what is normal by liver biopsy? What was the report actually? Uh, Sometimes report. we tend to read the conclusion is very dangerous because these are cut and paste. <laughs> the, the, the body might have florid autoimmune hepatitis. The comment may be a cut and paste error saying normal histology. Okay, so you have to be very careful. You have to go through what is there in the... Actually, sir, that, uh, in the report, I might have it in the report. Okay. It, it didn't, the, what they mentioned is it didn't show any Infiltration right. of inflammatory right. okay. cells. So you said this after four months, it's not uncommon for autoimmune hepatitis to come down on its own without immunosuppression. So it's a waxing and waning thing. There is, patient can have liver enzyme normalization without immunosuppression. That is very well known. Uh, and that may be the reason it has come down. When you say normal liver enzymes, what was the last liver enzyme? Were they actually normal? Yes, sir. The, what, what happened to the immunoglobulins? Do we have a repeat immunoglobulin? No, sir. No. Repeat immunoglobulin. We have referred her back to the hepatology team re regarding whether she needs a further evaluation. No? Mm. Uh, but I guess uh, that hepatology team also re wrote back us because since the liver enzymes has also, because initially they, they, they were trying to start on immunosuppression. Yeah, At yeah. that point of time only she has defaulted. Then uh, since it has been normalized, they uh, actually they wrote back that whether it could be drug induced. Mm, yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the most common differential diagnosis in autoimmune hepatitis is drug induced. Yes. Yeah, that is, that uh, can explain that uh, normal liver, liver histology. What was the gap between the liver biochemistry and the biopsy? Uh, so At the time of liver biopsy, were the enzymes high? It was uh, still elevated, but not around 400, sir, it was around 80 and 90, that mm, range. I think there would have been a significant delay from the presentation to the liver biopsy yes, because, yes, yes. because the patient was tried on vitamin E and lifestyle and so yeah. on. So that would, have, that would explain the less changes seen on histology. So I would not discharge this patient from the hepatology clinic. I would carefully follow up this patient for a recurrence of autoimmune hepatitis. I would do serial uh, ESRs, immunoglobulins, and liver biochemistry. Uh, uh, ASMA was negative. Yes, sir. ASMA was negative. So, and, so there are patients who are seronegative, and most of our patients are, in fact, seronegative. So that does not exclude autoimmune hepatitis. Any other comments here? Udita? Yeah, I also think that um, if you had done the biopsy at the time of uh, when the transaminases were that high, it is. I don't think it would have been normal. There must have been something. 
and if that uh, the the when the stance i mean is a settled down if the if the um, if it didn't show significant steatosis or anything worth uh, worth mentioning in the final comment then it's unlikely that the patient has some uh, long standing chronic disease like uh, metabolic associated steatohepatitis so it's probably some episodic thing so i, I would also uh, think very strongly about uh, autoimmune hepatitis actually it's a, we are used to looking at the liver biopsy report also i think that's also the small uh, difference in our, our views because we normally see if there's portal tracts have inflammation, um, how much there is, whether there's steatosis, whether there's fibrosis, things like that. So sometimes, uh, and, and if they, you know, there'll be a little bit of inflammation. So if there are plasma cells, we think of autoimmune hepatitis, things like that. So it's a bit difficult to take just the uh, last word uh, in our opinion because we will have to discuss. So that's why it's it a slight difference. Of course, like she has not been taking any other herbal products or anything like that mm -hmm. at all, no? So, um, yes, yeah, so we, we'll have to monitor her, as uh, my colleague said, uh, but... but uh. Uh, yeah. Finally, uh, we were advised uh, from the hepatology clinic. To avoid. Uh, uh, they discharge the patient and advise us not to repeat solid drug yeah, acid. Maybe that's a good but, idea. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, last month we gave solid drug acid mm. again because we mm. have no other option. What was because wrong with the alandronic? She got a. Uh, she had uh, gastritis. So was uh, she intolerance. Taking, was, she, was she taking the alandronic properly? Uh, after. Uh, that's the reason. So for nearly five years, we uh, the drugs were issued from the clinic, so we have no other option. So, second solentronic yes, acid was given okay. last month, and again we have repeated the liver enzyme, there was normal. Normal, okay. normal so. I don't think solentronic so, acid causes uh, so serious, So, there are a few serious, case yeah. reports are yeah, there. Yeah, not even in the product uh, the thing, uh, they would say sort of post-surveillance, uh, post-marketing surveillance, few cases few maybe. Few cases, yeah. but we yeah. can't explain why the ANA is this much of high and immunoglobulins so high. For me, it's still autoimmune hepatitis. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I also have a small comment. Um, so we also had a similar patient uh, presenting with like elevated liver transaminases and uh, uh, I can't remember the ANA was positive but initially followed up at the hepatology clinic and then um, they have done liver biopsy assay, liver biopsy also was normal and later she developed uh, uh, muscle weakness, proximal muscle weakness florid mo proximal muscle weakness, and it was dermatomyositis. Later, initial presentation was with transaminous elevation, but I think gamma GT wouldn't be high if it is uh, from muscle. No, gamma GT in is muscle, it would be AST elevation. Yes. Yeah. So we, in this patient, of course, gamma GT also high, but that patient only transaminases. So was so it AST? AST more than ALT. Yeah, okay. Yeah, AST more than... But I think it was ALT more than AST, like the pattern. It was not the usual pattern. But it was initially presented with like that, asymptomatic transaminous elevation. The biopsy also was normal. Initially, they have suspected whether it's autoimmune hepatitis, but later turned out to be um, dermatomyositis. Yes. Now the biopsy is also, if the biopsy is correct, and if the biopsy is not showing any hepatitis activity index, there we, are, we look at certain components of inflammation and fibrosis for the grading and staging. If the disease is quiescent, there is no place for immunosuppression. Thank you, sir. So that's why the patient should be monitored in the clinic. Yeah. For, for any, any uh, sort of recurrence, then we would commence. Yeah, I, I think because the diagnosis is unclear, uh, at the time of recurrence with the enzymes rising, we should get a b early biopsy because we know that there is a past history.
Good morning. Uh, let me take you all through the fifth case of the today's discussion. Uh, this patient, uh, Mrs. S, 42-year-old female, who is an on-patient with epilepsy, who was on treatment with the topiramate and the levetiracetam, and she is also an on-patient with systemic lupus erythematosus for the last 28 years. However, she has defaulted when she is present into the uh, presenting with this presentation. So she was admitted to the private sector, which was one year ago, uh, with right side abdominal pain for two weeks duration, which was associated with nausea and vomiting. During that admission, she also had arthralgia, myalgia, without any significant fever. However, the clinical history did not reveal any other clinical features to suggest active disease of SLE. On further inquiry, there was no associated jaundice, pruritus, or dark color urine, and patient denied any history of chronic diarrhea or acute diarrhea. And uh, going through her drug and the toxin exposure, she strongly denied exposure to any potential hepatotoxins, including alcohol or any illicit drugs, and there was no high risk behavior. Her drug history was only significant for levetiracetam and the topiramate. However, she was not on any disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs because she has defaulted SLE treatment for the last eight years. Examination also unremarkable other than mild right hypochondrial tenderness without any hepatosplenomegaly, icterus, or pale. And there was no ascites also noted in examination. Going through her investigations, the basic investigation, full blood count revealed thrombocytopenia with platelet count of 125,000 and there was mild anemia which was normochromic normocytic. She also had the elevated inflammatory markers including both ESR and the CRP, however procalcitonin level was within normal range. All the other basic investigations including renal profile and serum electrolyte, urine full report and thyroxine TSH level was normal. Coming to his liver profile, uh, we have noted there is elevated ALP and gamma GT as with the ALT and the AST which was more than three times of upper limit normal. However, the albumin level as well as the globulin level with the total bilirubin level was within the normal range. So, applying the R factor, it came as a 0.83, which was compatible with cholestatic liver injury. So, uh, think, uh, considering the differential diagnosis, uh, uh, for a cholestatic uh, liver injury in a patient with SLE, we have go ahead with the, the investigation, where anti-mitochondrial antibodies was negative, and hepatitis screening, which was hepatitis B surplus antigen, and hepatitis C, IgM, and IgG antibodies were negative. Uh, basic ultrasound revealed mild hepatomegaly with slightly increased echogenicity, which was compatible with early CLCD. However, there was no splenomegaly. So MRCP was completely normal without any evidence of primary cellulose cholangitis and no evidence to suggest biliary obstruction or calculi. But there was a slightly atrophic pancreas without any duct dilatation. Unfortunately, during that admission, the amylase level was not available, sir. And the CECT abdomen also performed. That also showed area of low enhancement in the pancreatic head with ill-defined margins. However, there was no pancreatic or biliary duct dilatation. So they have commented uh, regards to this pancreatic involvement, whether it's focal pancreatitis or neoplastic. So uh, we have proceeded with the liver biopsy also. That was also uh, normal other than the mild inflammation noted within the portal tracts. Uh, these are the uh, autoimmune profile we have performed in the patient. We are ANA was positive, which is nuclear homogeneous pattern with negative DSDNA. Regard to disease activity, C3, C4 level were within normal range. And during that admission, the APS screen was also performed. That was only positive with, for the lupus anticoagulant. All the other two antibodies were negative. So then, uh, lies with the gastroenterology team. They have only initiated patient on the ursodeoxycholic acid. Uh, with the ursodeoxycholic acid treatment, her liver profile was completely improved after three months of the treatment. 
So in summary, this is 42-year-old female who is a non-patient with epilepsy, who is on treatment with topiramate and the levetiracetam, and SLE without any evidence of the active disease, presented with right hypochondriac pain associated with vomiting. She does not have any clinical features of active SLE, and examination was unremarkable other than the mild right hypochondrial tenderness. Her investigations revealed cholestatic liver injury with mild thrombocytopenia, elevated inflammatory markers, positive lupus anticoagulants with normal C3 and C4 level. Her liver derangement was completely resolved with acetylcholic acid without any immunosuppression. So our question to the expert panel. So uh, what could be the cause for the liver derangement in this patient? Uh, can this be a presentation of lupus hepatitis or autoimmune hepatitis? And uh, we most of the time uh, come across this differentiation between the autoimmune hepatitis and the lupus hepatitis. So how are we going to differentiate these two? Uh, may, may I just ask what happened to the platelet count at the end of the period? That was uh, anyway in the, within the marginal low range. We thought of it could be due to the antipospolipid syndrome also because recently she presented with a mass thrombotic event also. Uh, but the scan queried early CLCD. Early CLCD, but CECT was not that. Yes, was but the, that the problem is actually first liver fibrosis. This uh, ultrasound is more sensitive than the CT actually. So, so we can't discount what the, uh, if a scan says CLCD, we actually have to go through the scan again. So if there are features of uh, nodularity on the surface, uh, things like that, then we have to be open to the possibility for a year old female patient mm -hmm with CACD, then um, can we go, go back to the biopsy report that you had mentioned? Yes. Uh, here you had, uh, say, uh, no, no, actually the biopsy, th this one, that's fine, thank you. Uh, sections of tissue displaying, 11 portal tracks. There's little or no portal track expansion, no bilateral, hepatitis are normal, no significant steatosis. So, uh, that's an important factor because fatty liver is a possibility. Uh, fatty liver we don't treat with acetylcholic acid, but it just happens that the liver functions do resolve with uh, acetylcholic acid. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, this pattern is very cholestatic, and I wouldn't consider fatty liver here. Uh, so, um, yeah. uh, so, occasion for site of acin migration. So basically, they haven't. Uh, yeah. So here, they have not given us any definite features of uh, autoimmune hepatitis. There is no uh, infiltration. There are no plasma cells. Uh, there is no bridging fibrosis. So at the moment, with this, uh, um, I, I think this Professor Janaki has reported this uh, uh, report also because we can see the the signature, which, and she is an expert in. Liver disease as well. So I think we have to factor all these things into consideration that uh, according to this liver biopsy, which has been done at the time that you have had increased liver function, so uh, it doesn't show any features of uh, an active hepatitis. Uh, I think I, either way, so I think we can't uh, discount that, that so the liver functions can go up transiently for so many reasons, uh, infection or whatever. But at the moment, no autoimmune hepatitis here uh, for us to uh, come to a diagnosis or to treat, in fact. Yeah, because uh, this degree of uh, gamma GT and ALP elevation is actually, it, I mean, then it, it can't be isolated autoimmune hepatitis. It has to be an overlap. Yes. And uh, uh, to label someone as having cholestatic hepatitis when uh, the bilirubin is normal, is uh, I think it's a little um, premature yeah. because uh, if if there is any meaningful cholestasis, then the bilirubin has to go up. Uh, so I don't think uh, I mean of course in in theory you are correct, but uh, in practice, I mean I wouldn't I because that is what the biopsy says because there is no evidence of cholestasis. For some reason, there has been uh, maybe a liver congestion or something, which was probably transient. But uh, because the bi biopsy, I, I would not expect to see polystasis in the biopsy because the bilirubin is normal, mm. basically. So let's ask the trainees, so what's happening? Anyone wants to volunteer and tell us what's happening?
So in this patient who is uh, SLE antiphosphorylipid syndrome positive, yes. yeah. So what was this right upper quadrant pain? We had to go back to the history sometimes, revisit the history and do the whole thing again. That's the best way to uh, sort out these patients. Was it a biliary colic? This right upper quadrant pain, vomiting, was it a biliary colic? History was not compatible with biliary colic. A biliary so colic is a very severe right upper quadrant pain with nausea and vomiting. The patient won't be at home sitting and being okay. They will come to the hospital. Was this a very severe pain or was the patient okay? It was severe pain but was constant type pain, mm. not a... So, uh, so a transient uh, uh, gallstone passing can give rise to this kind of enzyme elevation. Okay. So, this, that can be one explanation where the patient has had a gallstone which has come into the bile ducts but patient has actually now passed it. So that can be the one explanation. And in the presence of SLE and antiphospholipid syndrome, I would always think of vascular liver injury. So I would carefully get a Doppler or a CT but none of those were positive Doppler in this. Doppler was yeah, not normal, performed normal. at that time. But she the has CT would have shown yeah. it. Yeah. If the CT was done at the time of the enzyme elevation, there would have been any sort of picking up of a portal vein thrombosis like picture or a hepatic vein thrombosis or an outlet or inlet, uh, that kind of thing. So those are the two differentials that I would consider in this patient apart from a drug. So did you go through all the drugs, prescribed, yes. unprescribed, over-the-counter, supplements, herbal? Yes, sir. She was only on the levatory She was not taking anything no, else? Sir, no, So I would consider a drug induced liver injury, whether this is a stone that has passed or uh, whether this is a vascular thing. So the MRCP didn't show anything. Yes. There were no gallstones or anything, so the stone is out. Uh, drug is from the history. Anyway, it has settled. Uh, the other thing is vascular. But fortunately, it settled. Yes. Yeah. But uh, just to add, maybe we had to follow up to see whether the, what happens to the platelets and uh, because actually, um, if the platelets are low, and this, this is early CLCD, they have to have uh, hepatoma surveillance. These other things might be fine, but uh, they might do well for another 10 years. But if you get a hepatoma like that previous patient, that's the actual main thing of catching uh, early portal hypertension. So we miss, make sure that the aren't varices, the platelets were probably okay. But uh, hepatoma surveillance, and also we might have to follow up that irregularity, uh, irregularity in the pancreas also. I wonder whether we did anything like tumor marker CA 19-9 for pancreatic no, CA. Sir, no, that, yeah. that, uh, I think we should also uh, uh, go for a US to assess what that pancreatic lesion is. That also can, that also can explain uh, some of the features. And uh, uh, IgG4 disease, yes, definitely in this patient uh, who is uh, having a background of autoimmune disease, we should not forget autoimmune cholangiopathy. And uh, if the patient can afford IgG4 level, would be helpful. Um, another thing to add is, uh, why is this not primary biliary cholangitis, trainees? Obviously, the biopsy is not showing anything if he didn't have the biopsy. Sorry? Yeah, negative AMA. There is a AMA negative primary biliary cholangitis, but that is extremely rare. The other thing is, with the, this degree of liver derangement, the patient should have had preceding pruritus by now. So it's very uncommon to get patients who don't have pruritus to come with this degree of liver derangement. So it's not PBC. Thank you, sir. Yes, Nazir. Uh, all the credits to asodeoxalic acid in this no, case? No, it would, it would have generally come down on its own, I think. Uh, also would have been helpful if the bilirubin was high. So there is no definite indication it was given. So we will never know whether it was the ERSO or the natural history. But I think it's natural history, whatever that came down. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think there is no indication. Thank you very much. Uh, so, for the last case-based discussion, I uh, invite uh, Senior Registrar in Rheumatology and Rehabilitation, Dr. Shashika Madhurak.
Are we too fast in discussing? <laughs> Okay. Uh, good morning to all of you again. Uh, so this is the uh, case number six and the, the last case for the day. So I will uh, go through the summary of the case. Uh, this is a 30-year-old female uh, patient who is unmarried uh, and not employed. And she is a patient with uh, seropositive rheumatoid arthritis and systemic sclerosis overlap syndrome, which was diagnosed since uh, 2020. And the disease has complications like uh, interstitial lung disease and severe pulmonary hypertension. So going back to the uh, history of the uh, her, uh, disease, uh, she presented in 2020 uh, with the uh, complaint of inferior type symmetrical polyarthritis and fingertip pulses and Reynolds phenomena. And on examination, there was evidence of uh, bilateral symmetrical uh, polyarthritis uh, with active cyanovitis. And uh, other physical signs suggest of uh, diffuse cutaneous type of systemic sclerosis. Investigations wise, uh, she had uh, ESR of 84 and the ANA was positive. Uh, rheumatoid factor was high, theta positive 128. DNA panel was positive for anti SCL70 antibody. And the lung function tests were uh, suggestive of a restrictive lung disease, but the HRCT test was normal. So uh, we started treatment with methotrexate uh, 12.5 mg weekly with folic acid and uh, weight adjusted uh, HCQ and if you define for the Reynolds phenomena. And in all the patient was asymptomatic uh, with regards to the uh, gastrointestinal involvement, especially the GORD symptoms and the dyspeptic symptoms. We proceeded with upper GI endoscopy, which revealed a hyatosernia and grade 2 uh, reflux esophagitis. Stomach and the duodenum appeared normal. So patient was started on uh, proton pump inhibitors and the domperidone as well. Uh, however, after 9 months of treatment, patient uh, defaulted from the clinics. And she reappeared in the clinic uh, three years later uh, with the complaint of extensional shortness of breath, palpitation, and the low volume selling going on for a couple of weeks following an acute febrile illness. And at that time, uh, found to have patient had a very low hemoglobin of six, which was managed with blood transfusion. And the echo revealed a severe pulmonary hypertension with right ventricular failure. So, and in addition to that, uh, patient had clinical evidence of interstitial lung disease as well by means of. Uh, by fine by basal inspiratory repetitions. So this initial part was managed by a cardiology team and then referred back to the rheumatology department uh, after the acute problems were settled. So by the, by the time patient comes to us, uh, patient had very active layer of the systemic sclerosis, predominant systemic, systemic sclerosis and the ESR was very high, 114 and the HRCT just revealed NSIB pattern of interstitial lung disease. And we started treatment with IV rituximab, six month pulses uh, together with the oral MMF. And uh, for the anemia workup, uh, patient had no overt bleeding. Uh, the blood pictures were suggestive of a normocytic normochromic anemia with uh, subpopulation of uh, hypochromic microcytic cells suggestive of iron deficiency. Uh, there was no evidence of hemolysis. Ferritin was 400, probably related to the active disease. And uh, patient was started with oral iron supplements as well to cope up the iron deficiency. However, two months later, when she comes back, uh, she complained of severe burning, epigastric pain, and regurgitation. Uh, while on omeprazole and the domperidone with uh, proper treatment adherence, so the treatments was uh, we, we we took the gastroenterology input at this particular point, and they changed the treatment to pantoprazole 40 with mosaprid. Uh, however, after three months, uh, when we following up her in the clinic, uh, she had the progressive dyspeptic symptoms, uh, especially the severe heartburn and retrosternal fullness after meals, uh, as well as the regurgitation and the nausea after meals. So uh, she had uh, uh, markedly dis reduced her desire to eat because of these troublesome symptoms, uh, which uh, provoke after the meals. And in addition to that, we noted that patient is losing her weight as well. Uh, when she comes uh, six months back, the weight was around 37 kilos, and the current weight was 32 kilos uh, during this episode. Uh, so she had a 5 kilogram of uh, weight loss over the 6 months. So this is the this is how she was appeared. Uh, this photo was taken and the, she consented for uh, a published this on a scientific forum. And you can appreciate the patient is really emaciated. 
And uh, at this particular point, we repeat the upper GI after lies with the gastroenterology team. Uh, as you can see, uh, the positive findings, uh, patient had uh, gastro evidence of gastroesophageal reflux and had, had a class 3 hydrocenia. Uh, so they have planned the, this patient for esophageal manometry, uh, which is pending. However, by this time, the most of the systemic sclerosis related symptoms were in remission in terms of the uh, Reynolds phenomena and the other systemic sclerosis related symptoms are in remission and patient has no chronic diarrhea or steatorrhea. So on examination, the BMI is very low, 15.2. Uh, clinical other system examination was unremarkable, especially in view of the loss of weight. The uh, patient had no hepatosplenomegaly or lymphadenopathy. Uh, and the uh, six minute walking tests were improving, suggestive of the diseases uh, the responding to our uh, biological treatment. And the other investigation file, the ESR was 40 and static around 40 for the last uh, three, four months. Uh, CRP was normal. Uh, the repeat full blood counts, the white cell count and the platelets were normal, but the hemoglobin was persistently on the low side around 8 grams per deciliter. And the repeat HRCT chest also showed uh, there was no significant interval changes. That means the disease is not in the progressive state. However, we did the other investigation to uh, find out any other cause of loss of weight like MAN2 and TBG in expert were negative. Uh, the scan abdomen was normal. Uh, TSH and the fasting blood sugar were normal. Because she did the colonoscopy, although she had no uh, lower GI symptoms, which was normal. Uh, albumin was low normal, uh, PTA, PTT normal, and the creatinine and calcium were normal. Uh, the repeat blood pictures were uh, consistent with the normal normal anemia and the persistence of the hypodermic microcytic red cells. Uh, there was no atypical cells. The ferritin was 28. Uh, the stool for cold blood was negative. So at that, that this particular point of view, point, point, uh, we have a couple of questions. The bulk of the question is the first one. Uh, these are for the expert opinion here. The first one is the patient is having refractory dyspeptic symptoms resulting in reduced oral intake and significant weight loss. So we wonder whether this is uh, probably the esophageal plus or minus gastric involvement in the system sclerosis and uh, what further evaluation that we can do uh, or what are the other treatment options available for this kind of patient, the first thing. And the second thing is the this patient is having, again, unexplained uh, refractory sort of iron deficiency anemia, which is not responding to oral iron. So whether the patient is not uh, absorbed absorb enough uh, oral iron that we give, or whether the patient is having occult bleeding from the other sides, which may be related to the systemic sclerosis. OK, uh, thank you for that uh, detailed history. So just to clarify, now this patient, uh, you said, was initially diagnosed and then was lost to follow up for some time and then reappeared with what looks like right heart failure yeah. uh, edema. Yeah. And then uh, now wh what, uh, what type of timeline are we talking about up to this present point? Is it like months or years? Uh, the initial presentation was in 2020. Okay. Uh, then uh, she was with us for nine months. Okay. Then, uh, then thereafter she was defaulted and reappeared after two and a half years. Like. Okay. And uh, after that, um, uh, how long did it take after six uh, rituximab doses? No, uh, uh, we gave six monthly two cycles. Oh, sorry, six monthly two cycles. Right. Sorry. Um, so after that, the other features uh, resolved. But uh, there was was there a significant reflux, symptomatic reflux. At this time, when you found out that she was iron deficient and the, the BMI was low and she was not gaining weight? Yeah, that was one of her major complaints at that particular point. Of time. Okay. Because obviously, I mean, you, you have to sort of, uh, we need a little bit more information to sort of uh, uh, give an uh, opinion regarding this, whether this is actually uh, is a vagal involvement of uh, steroidal. Uh, or systemic sclerosis, um, and um, if if you can attribute this uh, her current weight and her poor uh, like uh, poor weight gain uh, to her symptoms, if she has uh, significant reflux, um, uh, like uh, low, uh, if she's taking small meals and if she has reflux at night, or because of that, if you can directly attribute it to the history, I think it's fair enough to <clears throat> sort of assume that that is the significant uh, contribution. Well, uh, actually, to um, I think we need a little bit more information from the uh, first of all from the endoscopy. To be fair, because uh, you just said it's uh, gas, uh, it, it says I'm sure it, it was not mentioned, uh, but uh, it only says gastroesophageal reflux. So, usually in patients with uh, systemic sclerosis related uh, um, esophageal involvement, they have very severe reflux, and there is actually a way to grade the reflux. 
uh, erosive reflux, there is a Los Angeles classification, uh, 1 to 4, and usually they have 3 or above. I mean, it's, I, I don't know whether there's any research evidence, but we, what we see. Um, so then there is very obvious evidence of severe reflux and, uh, you know, which can have complications in the future as well. Um, so I think uh, that, that bit of information is, a little, uh, is necessary to sort of um, give a, you know, uh, a very uh, strong opinion on this. But uh, definitely esophageal manometry should be the way to go. I mean, then uh, you would, uh, because uh, like I have seen patients, of course, in the periphery who uh, have these symptoms and they have attributed it to maybe achalasia or uh, sometimes they attribute it to uh, like a, a GORD and they do a fundoplication or hyalurus myotomy or some surgery in these patients without a manometry. Then that would be, uh, that is ultimately that's the patient is go going to suffer until the end of their lives. So it's always important to look at the manometry. So during the manometry, we check whether the esophageal peristalsis is happening properly, whether the, uh, the whether there is any uh, uh, sort of um, uh, dyssynergia in the in the esophageal muscle, and also at the lower esophageal sphincter, because uh, I mean it, it could very well be I mean of, but uh, in this case there is no history, but if there is evidence of achalasia, then our, our management would be different. So uh, I think uh, that would be the sort of, uh, I don't think there is uh, a definite diagnostic investigation to say whether it's definitely uh, systemic sclerosis related esophageal involvement. But if the esophageal manometry also shows that the esophagus is dilated and it, it's, the peristalsis is happening poorly, then that would sort of confirm the diagnosis from my point of view. Um, of course, uh, in uh, optimizing the management, of course, there are several things we can try. Uh, the basic management, if it shows evidence of gastroesophageal reflux and uh, if there is significant symptoms, would be lifestyle management and uh, uh, the PPIs I would try to optimize as much as possible. Lifestyle management, of course, you have to uh, advise them to take small frequent meals, calorie-rich meals and get a nutritional referral and also, you know, manage their symptoms, sort of, especially if they get nocturnal symptoms, make sure that you don't, don't go to sleep like for three hours after your dinner, keep your bed, uh, the head end of the bed elevated by about 15 degrees. So those, those things they can try. Um, and uh, with regards to the PPI, that should be the backbone of the therapy. But uh, there are certain instances, of course, on, on theory, in theory, there are no differences between PPI, if you look at the literature. But there are certain uh, patients who, uh, who uh, sort of uh, respond differently. So there, I think there is a place for trying a different PPI, like esomeprazole or abiprazole. And uh, maybe optimizing the prokinetics. Uh, for example, the mosopride, I think it's a three times a day dose. Uh, so maybe you can try that. And additional, additional prokinetics can also be tried. Uh, if there is evidence, if there is evidence to say that there is uh, gastroparesis, but uh, I mean, I, I don't think that that was there. Sometimes we try things like baclofen and uh, melatonin in patients with reflux. I don't really know how how that is going to be applicable here. I think maybe uh, Prof Niriyal can sort of uh, give an opinion on that. But failing all these things, if the reflux is so bad and the patient is unable to uh, sort of tolerate any oral feeds, then there may be a point for, at the extreme level, may be a point for nasogenal or, uh, sorry, um, for um, uh, PEG or PEG or PEG J uh, placement as well, if the patient is unable to tolerate uh, the feeds. But of course, it, if you have a lot of reflux, even with a PEG, if you give a large feed, then you can get uh, symptoms. So sometimes you might have to go for a jejunal extension. Um, I don't know if uh, Prof. Niriyal has anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, So, uh, so this patient's uh, anemia finally was iron deficiency. So it confirmed that the ferritin is low. Uh, we usually take a cutoff of uh, ferritin of 45 in the presence of anemia. Is uh, suggestive of iron deficiency anemia if there is no inflammation. And once the disease was controlled, uh, Ultimately, the ferritin levels came down. So, I would not attribute that iron deficiency anemia to uh, the reflux unless it's uh, Los Angeles grade three or four. If it was just grade one or two, or sorry, Los Angeles grade, uh, yeah, uh, mild degree of reflux. So we have to. So in your second question, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. So we have to consider 
some other source of blood loss because the lower GI was normal. The upper GI, if it was not showing severe reflux, we would have to do a small bowel study and that would be a video capsule first and then if necessary, we would do uh, an enteroscopy. Uh, that we have to address. And uh, uh, yes, as Uditha said, it's very important these problematic patients to get the pH and the manometry, pH impedance and manometry, just to very clearly find out what's going on and what is the component that is causing the symptoms. So that is very important in this kind of refractory patients. Uh, other things Sudhita has uh, uh, talked about, iron absorption, yes. So treating iron deficiency, uh, we have to be very careful because uh, uh, we have to see whether we are giving the optimal dose of iron. So please don't treat iron treatment. If you are giving orally, don't give it twice a day. There is no point in giving twice a day because if you give a warning dose of oral iron, that will increase what is called hepcidin. Hepcidin will is a natural protein because we don't have any mechanism to excrete iron. So if we get too much of iron, we are iron overloaded. That is why repeated transfusions, patients get iron overload. There is no natural way of getting rid of iron in the human body. So the iron regulation is very strictly controlled by something called hepcidin that is produced in the liver. So a morning dose of iron will increase hepcidin and hepcidin will inhibit the evening dose of iron absorption. So there is no point of giving an evening mm -hmm. dose of iron absorption. So there is no evening dose. So it's only once a day. If with that also the patient is intolerant. So the reason why some patients don't tolerate iron is that evening dose that is not absorbed remains in the intestine and causes gastrointestinal side effects. Okay. So if still the patient is not uh, tolerating oral iron daily, you can give it every other day. So the guidelines now recommend either daily or every other day, morning dose of iron. So don't overtreat these patients. And in this kind of patient, I would actually try, I mean, there is no malabsorption here, uh, the patient. So I would try oral iron first and see the retic response and the HB response. We would expect within two weeks to some retic response and uh, give the iron make sure that we go beyond three months, at least up to three months, to make sure that the HB is also normalized and the iron stores are also replenished, so minimum of three months. So if we don't find that iron response, the retic count or the hemoglobin, then we might be dealing with uh, a malabsorptive state in this patient who is complicated, then we can consider parental RIA. So if that is the answer. Definitely in this patient, I would think this warrants small bowel evaluation with uh, video capsule and later on with uh, enteroscopy. Just to add, uh, that, so, so then our plans would be to go for video capsule to exclude any bowel cause. But I, I, sometimes due to right heart failure, also uh, intestinal edema can cause a lot of loss of appetite and symptoms. Also, I wonder, does she have ankle swelling or need diuretics or anything like that at the moment? When she was present in the acute stage, she had features of right heart failure, but clinically now uh, the right heart failure is set, sorted like under control. And uh, also, I think that that's about it. But um, I would just add sometimes, uh, because there are a lot of trainees, like uh, dyspepsia is not always due with the esophagus. Uh, I mean, uh, I think my colleagues won't agree, might not agree, but I would screen for, for stress, depression, things like that as also because they're chronic chronic illness, uh, she's not able to do over a long period of time, you can see how she's feeling. So uh, children, go, like they have lots of stress factors which also play, so that will also add to the interpretation of the dyspeptic symptoms, because you can see even with pH manometry, we might not offer so much more than PPIs and things like that, no indication for underplication. So uh, things like that may be like uh, uh, subtle things, but it might help in the overall management of the patient. Uh, Actually, the pH uh, will give uh, uh, pointers towards a psychological component because there is something called symptom associated sort of index and all that, where we see actually no acid or non acid reflux, but the patient complains of symptoms. So, esophageal hypersensitivity is not uncommon in these kinds of patients. So, we will have to address with neuromodulators.
yeah, actually, as Uditha said, uh, in that kind of patient, there is no option. If we can't get the symptoms under control, it would not be a peg probably. The peg again, the patient will complain of uh, reflux after a standard meal. So it would be a sort of peg J or a uh, surgical jejunostomy. Because if the patient is just keeps on losing weight, that's not going to be helpful. They are going to be more frail and sarcopenic and get more infections. The chest is going to be affected overall. The quality of life and the survival is going to be poor. So I think, uh, if have you all ordered for a uh, pH manometry? Yeah, she's already there. Yeah, so depending on that, we will have to decide on the further management. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. the end of very fruitful discussion. So before the next presentation by Dr. Udita Dasanayaka uh, on uh, rheumatological drugs and liver. Uh, so I would like to uh, speak few words regarding our view on this uh, medic medic medication. Uh, so um, we, uh, we use a lot of medications. And uh, out of these, we just know that some medications are safe, like Prof. Miriel mentioned. M MMF, so mycophenate morphetine, so we use freely even in patients with liver disease, and um, hydroxychloroquine, and also maybe azathioprine, but azathioprine also causes liver can cause liver enzyme elevation. Um, and we, we know that uh, TNF inhibitors and rituximab can be used in compensated liver disease. Um, and, but most of the other drugs, the, there is uh, effect on liver. Um, so uh, methotrexate, so it's like worth mentioning. So it's the most useful drug for us. And it's used in rheumatoid arthritis. It's the, it's the anchor drug in rheumatoid arthritis. When we diagnose, that's the first drug that we start in rheumatoid arthritis. And in psoriasis also, for psoriatic arthritis as well as skin, uh, methotrexate is effective. So that's, the, that's a cheap drug, and it's very effective drug. And always we have problems with methotrexate and liver. So usually what we do is whenever we start methotrexate, we just screen like uh, maybe just basic uh, liver function, uh, liver tests, but we don't do ultrasound scan as such. So before starting methotrexate, and uh, we usually we start the medicine, and uh, in about six weeks time we monitor the liver transaminases, and uh, if it's more than double, usually either reduce the dose or if more than double, always we stop and then uh, we wait till it becomes normal and then restart with uh, smaller doses. And if it is uh, like just little elevation, so usually we reduce the dose and then uh, reduce the dose and continue. So that's how we monitor. But with uh, particularly when methorex is not effective, lefronomide is the other drug that is very effective in rheumatoid arthritis. We combine in, when we, in combination liver transaminase elevation is more common, I think more toxic, but uh, with mon usually two monthly we monitor initially, and if it is always normal, we like we reduce the frequency of transaminase monitoring. And, uh, but when, uh, so if it is uh, advanced liver cell disease, as you mentioned, so we don't, uh, we don't uh, continue with Rexit, but uh, as you mentioned, so according to this landmark study, so liver fibrosis is not attributed to methotrexate, but it's likely to other metabolic risk factors. That is very important to know. And even in uh, um, interstitial lung disease also, it was same. So earlier, so whenever there is uh, um, ILD, interstitial lung disease, they used to stop, we used to stop methotrexate. But now we know, and even the respiratory physicians, now they agree. And the, uh, so we don't stop it. So we know that it's not due to the um, drug, but it's due to the disease itself, interstitial lung disease. So, so it's very important for us to know uh, how to continue methotrexate when there's advanced liver cell disease. And we, we, now we, after the discussions, we know something that we have to monitor and we have to re weigh the risks and benefits and to continue. So that's one thing. So, um, and other, other than methotrexate, we also want to know about these other medications. Like we, we heard that sulfasalicin is also used. We also use sulfasalicin whenever there's liver, like, uh, liver disease. Uh, sulfasalicin usually we use. Um, but 
sulfur, uh, the allergies are commoner with sulfur cysteine as the case discussed uh, today. And um, other than that, uh, you'd like to know that it's, it's uh, great to know that it's not good to continue low, even low dose steroids because of uh, when there is fatty liver. Otherwise, usually what we do is whenever there is liver disease, we continue like sulfur cysteine, hydroxychloroquine, and sometimes low dose steroids. Yeah, so that is good to know that it's not good. And other than that, NSAIDs also, it's a, like a very important drug for us, but it's um, uh, most of the time it's better not to continue on long term when it is con when the disease is controlled with disease modifying drugs. So sometimes the uh, most of uh, um, maybe most of us maybe uh, like like to continue NSAIDs, but it's like good to stop and because they are these are also having liver side defects and particularly with this advanced liver cell disease, these are contraindicated, as we um, as we know. And other than these, uh, like um, methotrexate, lefronomide, and the other drugs, and NSAIDs. So we'd like to know about cyclophosphamide and other drugs also. When to, uh, what is the limit of transaminases with to start uh, uh, cyclophosphamide? And um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so these are the things that we expect to know. And uh, yeah, so thank you, thank you very much for listening. I think uh, Udita will address some of the things in your presentation. Yes. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. So I think MTX is the drug that you all want sorted out. So as a baseline, I would suggest I think a full blood count and a, a liver biochemistry. Good to have a liver biochemistry, not just the STALT, as a baseline and ultrasound before starting, and avoid the MTX uh, in patients who have long-standing diabetes and those who are obese because those are the patients who will have at risk of advanced fibrosis. So other patients, it's quite uh, safe to continue with monitoring. Don't worry too much about a transient elevation that is common after initiation and dose escalation. It will come down usually. And most of these patients will tolerate the MTX. And for steroid manager, you want to say something? Yeah. Actually, what I meant is uh, not that it's a contraindication at all. It's just that uh, that is also a factor uh, in the progression of the fatty liver. So we had to. Uh, it's, it's not a completely harmless uh, thing. Drug. Uh, I, I feel because overall, and it depends on the patient. If we have a very obese patient, uh, then we know they're not adhering to the diabetic drugs at all. So in that patient, I mean, we need to do get him lean, exercising, lose the weight. Um, so steroids, it may temporarily help uh, sometimes, but uh, overall, uh, uh, it's sort of risk benefit. So I, I'm not saying that uh, we should st stop steroids, but we have to always, uh, like all the drugs, we have to weigh the benefits versus the risks, and um, we have to make sure that they really are adhering to dietary management and weight loss. Actually, is that, is that correct? Just uh, in a, put it in a simple terms, both steroids and NSAs from a GI hepatology point of view, lowest possible dose for the shortest duration. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for, uh, uh, I would like to thank the Rheumatology Association for giving us the opportunity to come and discuss these uh, common uh, issues uh, that uh, I think are, is going to be very useful for the audience. And uh, thank you, Madam, for sort of outlining what the what the uh, what the expectations are but unfortunately they were not uh, sort of i may not be covered completely because i was not made aware of all the small details but uh, we'll try to discuss as much as possible um, so when it comes to uh, uh, disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs and the liver basically there's methotrexate and there's everything else right so uh, basically we are talking about methotrexate for most of it obviously and uh, I think all of you are a little, um, I mean, it's a little, uh, it's a bit of a paradigm shift to think that methotrexate doesn't cause fibrosis. Because when, even when you were medical students, and maybe, you know, way before even when we were medical students, I mean, everyone was told, and it was like a gospel, that methotrexate causes fibrosis. And I'm sure you're all wondering, now suddenly they had one trial, and after one trial they are saying, no, methotrexate doesn't cause fibrosis. How does that happen? How, how did this, how did we come to this, right? So uh, just for, you know, I've just uh, put a table, of course, very uh, incomplete, very incomprehensive, just for the, the initial slide. Uh, um, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. So let's take the bull by the horns. So try to attempt to take the bull by the horns and talk about 
methotrexate and liver fibrosis. Okay. So, the potential liver toxicity of methotrexate, especially with the liver fibrosis, has been very, it's been around for basically generations. It was first detected in the 1960s. As Madam mentioned, almost exclusively in patients with psoriasis who were, uh, who were uh, taking methotrexate. Right? Because they were, uh, the patients developed uh, liver function abnormalities, they did liver biopsies and the liver biopsies showed fibrosis. And they followed up with repeated liver biopsies and the repeated liver biopsies confirmed progression of fibrosis. And they said, okay, methotrexate is causing fibrosis. But what you need to remember is the concept of uh, what we call now uh, metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver or steatotic liver disease, MESLD or NAFLD as it was called in the, in the, uh, before this, was only, it only came into the picture in the 2000s. So we, until the 2000s, we didn't know that there was something like this definitely. And the, the, the progression of uh, uh, fat, uh, metabolic, uh, the mesled or nephled and the progression and the fibrosis risk, those were completely unknown and they were uh, basically, they didn't even think about it at this time. So this, that, that metabolic side of things was completely out of the picture. And the other important disease that was not recognized at the time was hepatitis C which can also cause steatosis, which can also cause fibrosis. So they were so sure about uh, methotrexate-induced liver fibrosis that they did a separate uh, histological classification called the Roenick classification, which was just for methotrexate-induced liver fibrosis. So this was updated until, I think, 1980s or 1990. So I don't know whether you can see, this is the Roenick classification. So basically it has steatosis, worsening steatosis, uh, portal tract inflammation, mild fibrosis, worsening fibrosis and cirrhosis. So that is the Roenick classification. But if you take the NAFLD or the MASLD histology, the histological classification that we use for that, if you compare the two, there are, I mean it's almost completely similar. Right? So the features of methotrexate induced liver fibrosis that were described earlier were actually are actually very similar or almost identical to uh, this MASLD or MASH, metabolic dysfunction associated steatohepatitis, related liver fibrosis. So that was one, uh, one lingering problem that was in the background. It was always being debated. And the other reason was, now you, you, you may be wondering now, if you look at some dermatological guidelines from about five years ago, they were advocating routine liver biopsies for patients with, who was, or who are on methotrexate. Right? They were always saying biopsy, biopsy, biopsy. Right? So when I was a registrar, it was a, I was really confused as to why they were talking about biopsy because biopsy is a very invasive and it's a potentially dangerous test. So why do you routinely biopsy someone? So the reason for that was in the 1970s, they had said, okay, they followed these patients up with biochemical tests. They did liver functions, they did the transaminases. But when they, they were completely normal, but when they did the biopsy, there was fibrosis. So they said, okay, you have to biopsy because biochemistry is not a good indicator of methotrexate induced liver fibrosis. And actually that is true for metabolic MASH or NASH fibrosis because it's well known that the degree of AST LT elevation or biochemical dysfunction does not reflect the degree of fibrosis or steatosis. So then again, there is a similarity. There is a common thing there. And then came the concept of cumulative dose. So the cumulative dose came in the 1980s where they did biopsies in patients frequently because by that time, okay, methotrexate was causing fibrosis, it was totally justified to do biopsies. So they did bi serial biopsies to see at, at which cumulative dose, at which point, these patients started to show evidence of fibrosis. Right. Um, so they said up to 26% of psoriasis, psoriasis patients develop fibrosis while on methotrexate. So they just completely justified to follow up. And then they did serial biopsies and said, okay, 1.5 grams is probably a safe cumulative dose. After that, you probably have to check for biopsy. Uh, you have to check for fibrosis by doing a biopsy. But they did further studies later, but they failed to show this, uh, confirm this recommendation. And then um, the, the, the amount of data about liver fibrosis 
increased exponentially because of these non-invasive tests. Now we didn't do, uh, didn't need to do biopsies anymore. We need, we had, we had these non-invasive tests. So we, uh, there, there was a lot of data coming with non-invasive tests without biopsies, which again didn't show any uh, effect, uh, uh, any association with cumulative dose. But what the cumulative dose does have is it is closely related to the elapsed time. So if the patient has been on the cumulative dose is more, that means the patient has been on methotrexate for longer. So we know that that, that is also similar for this MASH or, you know, ideally MASH, but, you know, I don't want to confuse you even further, but NASH cirrhosis, right? So that also takes time. It's a gradual progression, right? So again, so they were just wondering whether this description of cumulative dose was just a description of the natural progression of uh, NASH cirrhosis, right? So then they re-evaluated all the things and they looked at associated factors that were actually confirmed. They did meta-analysis and uh, they tried to find actually confirmed associated factors for liver fibrosis in patients on methotrexate for any, any indication. So the actual associated factors were high BMI, obesity, diabetes, alcohol consumption and pre-existing liver disease. So those are the actual proven things that are associated. So basically these patients all had other risk factors to develop uh, liver disease and liver fibrosis. And this is the landmark study uh, done uh, in, by the Nottingham group. They all uh, recruited almost about 1000 patients and they followed them up uh, multi-center uh, with uh, non-invasive markers to see whether there is any evidence, evidence of increased risk of liver fibrosis with uh, methotrexate. But the cumulative dose of methotrexate or the duration of methotrexate was not associated with elevated liver stiffness. And uh, they, uh, the actual things that were related were type 2 diabetes and uh, body mass index. So then they said, <coughs> finally, advanced liver fibrosis and cirrhosis that were previously attributed to methotrexate are actually caused by metabolic liver disease or other chronic liver diseases and not by methotrexate itself. Right? So, there is not enough evidence to say that methotrexate initiates liver fibrosis. But then the question is whether it is completely safe to give methotrexate to a patient who already has liver fibrosis. <coughs> there are, uh, so, I, you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm sure you can't see this, but there are, you know, certain mechanisms with, that have been uh, postulated which, uh, through which methotrexate can induce liver fib uh, not induce but uh, sort of promote liver fibrosis so like you know the, it increases the the fibroblast differentiation collagen formation it increases the free radical formation so all these putative mechanisms are still there so it may have an indirect role in the progression of it should be mesled here but i use nephel because that's the commoner term so um, it might have an indirect role in the progression so we have to be a little careful with using methotrexate in patients who have who already have liver fibrosis and it also causes folate deficiency <coughs> which may also play a role but this is yet to be proven and as of yet there are no clear recommendations as to when to stop and when to start and when not to give <coughs> but of course something that is well known is <coughs> as madam said acute hepatotoxicity due to methotrexate. This is actually dose dependent. So it is a very clearly, you can show a clear association. It's very common when you use high doses like 25 milligrams a week, right? But in lower doses, it is very, I mean, it's, it's relatively uncommon. Uh, that's what the literature says at least. <coughs> so usually it's a moderate and transient elevation of enzymes. Fulminant or life-threatening uh, so, uh, severe acute hepatitis has only been described with high dose methotrexate given parenterally, usually in a chemotherapy setting. So, uh, it has not been described in uh, this uh, normal doses we use in everyday practice. It is rarely uh, more than three times upper li limit of normal and as madam said, I mean you can actually reduce the dose and uh, you can continue the methotrexate if the ASTLT improves and of course you can stop and re-challenge which is also very well accepted. 
but of course whether a patient who gets acute hepatotoxicity whether that patient is more at risk of fibrosis progression or whether that is a trigger for you know uh, already existing uh, fatty liver to go into fibrosis that of course we don't know so there are no clear recommendations regarding that so i'm sorry this uh, this formatting has all changed and uh, everything is out of their boxes so uh, so now the question is how do we uh, how do we practically approach starting uh, methotrexate in a patient uh, who we who we think needs methotrexate so what uh, what of course the article suggests suggests is like you have to check as i mean madam said i'm sure you are doing all this already you have to check for risk factors you have to check and document risk factors and then you have to modify those risk factors diabetes dyslipidemia alcohol intake so these risk factors are not contraindications these are just indicators that you need to be extra careful in these patients and you need to take additional measures to make sure that the patient doesn't uh, develop progressive liver disease of course also you had at the same time check for high risk features which can indicate that this patient already has uh, established advanced chronic liver disease or moderate to severe fibrosis so you can do that you can get a rough idea by doing a liver biochemistry and as a, a fib four score and a viral hepatitis screen is also recommended i don't know how how uh, strictly we need to stick to that in in our setting in the in the presence of normal liver functions uh, because uh, i mean we are not we are a relatively low prevalence country for hepatitis b and hepatitis c so just a mention of uh, fib four score i think uh, professor niriyal went into went into it very very uh, very extensively and deeply so uh, you can use it to sort of um, rule out liver five significant liver fibrosis and it should ideally be used within uh, uh, within 35 to 65 more than 30, 65 years old there are different cut offs less than 35 it's not recommended so uh, you can use it to uh, risk classify these patients according to their risk of uh, significant or uh, um, advanced liver fibrosis <coughs> so again i don't think uh, you can see this so again now there are no clear guidelines as to what to do so they have given this very complex uh, appearing thing which as which actually contains what i already said so if you have any of those high risk features like hepatitis uh, like high fib fib four scores um, uh, persistently deranged liver functions uh, hepatitis b or c positivity or an ultrasound uh, abnormality then you should probably get a hepatology opinion before deciding on whether to start on methotrexate or not but i think you are already doing that so it's just a it just mentions what we already know if everything is normal or everything is acceptable once you start the methotrexate you have to regularly monitor uh, the alt and the fib4 and other liver biochemistry unfortunately there are no clear guidelines as to how often you should monitor and they if there is increase of more than 2% 2% uh, two times from the baseline or if there's uh, uh, increase in more than 100 in alt then you should uh, stop the methotrexate until the, it normalizes or you can even try reducing the dose again all these decisions will be made should be made according to the risk and the the benefit ratio so uh, i'm sure uh, it will have to be uh, probably driven by your rheumatological uh, disease and its current activity state <coughs> so if it's not resolving despite methotrexate uh, uh, stopping uh, omitting methotrexate then you probably need to go back to uh, 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 liver clinic and sort of get a opinion on how to proceed <coughs> of course if there is a uh, obvious decompensated liver disease or decompensated advanced chronic liver disease then that is actually a contraindication to restart or continue <coughs> methotrexate um so yeah so in basic basic summary that that is what the current situation regarding methotrexate uh, induced or methotrexate uh, related uh, liver issues and they are current uh, sort of uh, how to sort of manage them uh, in the current practice so just a brief uh, discussion about other demands <laughs> so what we need to understand is that so when we are talking about uh, drug induced liver injury there are basically broadly two types there are dose dependent ones and there are idiosyncratic ones uh, so dose dependent ones of course you need to be careful if you are starting with in a patient with uh, advanced liver disease or whether who patient who has liver uh, compromise 
uh, but uh, of course uh, you can control the dose and you can sort of uh, manage sometimes with the continuing the same drug. But uh, when you talk about idiosyncratic hepat hepatotoxic reactions, uh, they do not actually appear more commonly in patients with already already existing you know uh, chronic liver disease they don't uh, i mean idiosyncratic reactions are not more common in patients with liver cirrhosis basically but if they do get idiosyncratic reactions then the effects will be much more severe and catastrophic so uh, then you have to be very careful if the patient has decompensated advanced chronic liver disease if there are features of decompensation then you have to be very careful in with drugs even drugs which have uh, recorded idiosyncratic uh, hepatic uh, liver reactions. <coughs> so, when you go to leflunamide, it is the liver derangements are usually mild, self limiting, and asymptomatic transaminase elevations. Uh, but it is recommended that uh, you monitor ALT monthly for 6 months, then every other month they have not given a duration, probably for uh, indefinitely. <coughs> Severe injury is rare, but an interesting thing about leflunamide, it, it is actually uh, secreted through the enterohepatic circulation of bile salts. So, you can use bile salt binders like cholestyramine to help with uh, leflunamide clearance in a case of uh, severe hepatotoxicity with leflunamide and that will help to clear the uh, drug uh, quickly of the uh, system. <coughs> and of course, most of these drugs have an increased risk of hepatitis B re reactivation. Uh, Sulfasalazine in about 4 percent of cases, uh, there are mild elevation of transaminases mostly, but sometimes you can get severe hepatitis. And as was discussed earlier, Sulfasalazine usually cause uh, a um, sort of a allergic type of or a, uh, it is usually associated with a dress syndrome. Um, so, uh, it is uh, more of an idiosyncratic reaction which can, which can sometimes steroids will help, but then if you get a severe reaction with sulfasalazine then you should definitely not rechallenge. And when you get a reaction with sulfasalazine it is not always due to the sulfa, sometimes it can be due to the, uh, the 5 ASA aminosalicylate uh, molecule as well. It is not just sulfa allergy, the other, uh, other component can also cause uh, severe allergic reactions. And of course, hydroxychloroquine, I mentioned because it is hydroxychloroquine is very safe and uh, very rare to have uh, clinically apparent liver injuries. And as was discussed, uh, isothioprine and MMF also we use in patients with uh, uh, established liver disease as provided they are uh, compensated, albeit with a bit of caution. Uh, TNF inhibitors, of course, they again can be used in patients with uh, compensated advanced chronic liver disease and infliximab in particular can sometimes trigger an autoimmune reaction and the patients can develop an autoimmune type of hepatitis as a reaction to that. I think uh, etanercept is the, is the least common one to cause uh, this sort of a reaction and infliximab is the most common one. And of course, obviously, it can cause hepatitis B reactivation and uh, tuberculosis reactivation. Um, rituximab, actually rituximab is a <coughs> interesting case because uh, the main, co main worry about uh, rituximab is hepatitis B reactivation. We are worried in particular in about rituximab because they usually when it, when it reactivates they get very severe disease. And if a patient develops active hepatitis B with jaundice uh, while on rituximab there is almost a 10 percent mortality. So, there is a very high risk of death. So, we have to be very, very careful and screen for hepatitis B and if the hepatitis B surface antigen is positive and sometimes if the co-antibody is positive uh, with negative surface antigen then we might even think about uh, starting this patient on uh, prophylactic antivirals while we start on rituximab. <coughs> so, um, this is I suppose not new but uh, you know some tofacitinib which is now becoming widely and widely available. I think there are other um, Janus kinase inhibitors that are uh, coming out in their class. Uh, tofacitinib is usually, I mean it is usually uh, does not cause major liver issues. Uh, elevated transaminases more than 3 times upper limit of normal in 1 to 2 percent and they often resolve without any dose adjustment. So, you can just monitor and see. 
and of course uh, there is a uh, theoretical risk of hepatitis B reactivation. Um, so yes, that's uh, actually all I uh, prepared. Uh, if you have any questions, I suppose we can uh, we can entertain, and uh, I'm sure the expert panel will help me in uh, sorting out your uh, any queries. <coughs>